Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, oversight hearing on summer youth on primate. My name is Matthew Eugene, and I'm the chair of the Youth Social Services Committee. The last hearing on September, on, on summer, the last hearing on summer youth on primate program was on February 25, 25th, 2016. During that hearing, DYCD highlighted the increase in SYEP participants from the previous years, its continuing implementation of the Work, Learn, Grow program, and its ongoing effort to increase the number of uh, private sector employers. Some of the questions are asked, DYCD included, are the track, are the track participant after the complete SYEP? Are participants evaluated their experience and whether disconnected youth could be part of the work, learning, growth program? I'm looking forward to learning what improvement or changes DYCD has made in those areas among others. Last year, a SYEP task force was convened by the Mayor Bill de Blasio and New York City Council Speaker Melissa McVeverito. The task force was responsible for assessing the key areas where SYP and WLG could improve and grow. The task force gathered information from focus groups with over 70 key stakeholders, including youth participants SYP and WLG providers, employers, and educators. Based on the information received from these meetings, the task force produced a report with a set of recommendations addressing some of the issues and concerns the focus group raised. <coughs> Including in these recommendations were a set of pilot programs that DYCD was to implement this past summer with the intent that the outcomes of those programs will inform the agency's request for proposals for next year SYP programs. As you are probably aware, the Summer Youth Employment Program is a now six week summer jobs program between July and August that provide youth between the age of 14 and 24 with work experience, life skills training, and much needed income. SYP also provides workshop and job readiness, career exploration, financial literacy, and opportunities to continue education and social growth. Program allocated with that community-based organization and government, and we turn to the private sector as well. In 2015, there were 9,156 separate work sites throughout the New York City located in all five boroughs. You have the option of applying for the program at CBO or online. Applications are available from March to April, and candidates are then entered into lotteries, system, specialized program, for disabled foster care, runaway homeless, and court involved youth are also available. As indicated, the Summer Youth Employment Program provides our New York City young people with summer employment and educational opportunities, both, both taught, teaches very important life skills as well. Before calling any witnesses, I must assert a point that in all my years as a member of this uh, city council and certainly as the chair of the Youth Services Committee, there has been no issue near and dear to me than the trouble of our youth and the obstacles they face, they often face. We must keep our children engaged in both after school and end the summer month, in addition to keeping them on a positive path that will enable them to reach their full potential as adults and lead a life filled with achievement and happiness. My background in youth programming 
and my deep concern for all who are struggling in society compel me to state publicly and as often as that possible that right here in our great city, there are literally thousands of young disconnected from their families and without a safe place to sleep each night. That is a harsh reality that we in posi position of first responsibility must never fail to consider on a daily basis, no matter what else we do. Finally, we can overemphasize, we can overemphasize that the simple dignity gained from that first summer job must never be taken for granted. That first job helps to assure that any young, any youth, so fortunate to be selected by SYP, stay on track and that there is hope for the future. No child in New York City deserves less than this. At this time, I would like to take, uh, my, uh, to thank, uh, to take uh, the opportunity to thank uh, my committee and all the staff who work very hard to make this hearing possible. I want to thank Akiwu Gishu, Michael Benjamin, Jessica Ackerman, and also my legislative director, Ethan Tucker, for their hard work in preparing for this important hearing. And I would like also to take the opportunity to thank each one and all of you here, all the providers, and all of you who are doing such a wonderful job in providing services to the young people of the great city of New York. And again, thank you very much to all of you, and welcome. Thank you. Would you please? Uh... Please raise your right hand. Uh, Andre, too. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the committee members' questions? I need yes. To... Okay, thank you. Before I start asking the question, I just want to uh, mention that we have been joined by our colleague, uh, Council Member Annabel Palma. She has to go because she got to go to share another public hearing. And again, Commissioner, thank you very much for being here for this hearing. You may start, please. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Eugene and members of the Committee on Youth Services. I am Bill Chong, Commissioner at the Department of Youth and Community Development. I'm joined by Andre White, Associate Commissioner, Youth Workforce Development. Thank you for the chance to testify today on the Summer Youth Employment Program, SYEP. We certainly appreciate the City Council's commitment and support of SYEP over the years. SYP is a vital program that helps young people gain work experience, explore careers, build skills, and prepare for their future. Together, we have made incredible progress. With the Council's strong support, Mayor de Blasio has doubled the size of the SYP over the past four years. DYC is very grateful for these investments since by doubling the program size through baseline funding, DYCD and its providers have been able to plan more effectively. This has helped to ensure the sustainable, sustainable development of quality job placements for young people that are engaging, generate interest in exploring future careers, and offer positive exposure to the workplace. Essentially, stable funding means a higher quality summer job experience. This past summer, New York City's Summer Youth Employment Program set a new record serving uh, nearly 70,000 young people, the largest SYP cohort in DYCD's history. With the support of the Center for Youth Employment, the city also had a record number of Ladders for Leaders participants serving 1,855 youth, an increase of 21% from 1,538 in 2016. Summer jobs for vulnerable youth who are homeless, court involved, or foster care increased by 4% from 3,050 to 3,170. Private sector work sites in 2017 comprised 45% 40 of SYP work sites, a 17-point increase from the 28% in 2014. In 2014, we set a goal of 45% for 
private sector work sites by 2017, and I'm proud to say we have achieved it. Our partnership with nearly 40 city agencies also contributed greatly to the success of SYP, with job placements once again in the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, the Department of Transportation, and Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and new ones at the New York City Police Department. And thank you again to the City Council for your role in hosting participants this summer. 26 council members and the director of the Progressive Caucus provided SYP and Lattice for Leaders with the chance to work in the offices of elected officials. In total, employers at over 12,000 work sites hired youth in diverse fields such as financial services, technology, real estate, fashion, healthcare, small business, law firms, museums, and sports enterprises. With such strong interest and partnership from the City Council, providers, advocates, and employers, SYP is poised to continue with success. We are planning for the future of SYP and have issued a concept paper that will inform the upcoming SYP request for proposal, RFP. The concept paper builds on the recommendations of the Youth Employment Task Force, which was commissioned in June 2016 by Mayor de Blasio and Speaker Mark, Melissa Mark Viverito to assess the key areas of growth and improvement for SYP and Work, Learn, and Grow, with implications for the full portfolio of New York City's youth employment initiatives. Other stakeholders represented on the task force included advocates, providers, and the philanthropic sector. The primary task force report recommendations include strengthening connections between SYP providers and public high schools to improve in-school career development for young people, serving younger youth through career expo exploration and project-based learning, enhancing support services including pre-program orientation and counseling to help meet the unique needs of vulnerable populations. The task force report also affirmed what we already know is SYP's overall goal, to provide youth with a set of work-related experiences that prepare them to succeed in employment. Through SYP, participants achieve the following objectives. Develop social skills, including communication, critical thinking, decision-making, and problem-solving skills, and self-management. Learn work norms and future and culture. Understand career pathways and decision points, including the interrelationship between educational attainment, relevant experience, de demonstrable skills, and career advancement. Build professional networks. And finally, uh, learn to manage money. I would like to thank Chair Eugene, Chair Ferreras Copeland, Councilman Mateo, and the and their team of colleagues, Council Members Chin, Gibson, Rodriguez, Torres, and Williams for their leadership on the Youth Employment Task Force and for working with us to plan the growth and evolution of, this, of these programs for future generations of participants. Since the release of the task force report, DYCD has considered how best to address its recommendations. We uh, anticipate making the following strategic changes to SYP. Expand access to underserved populations by enhancing existing programming or creating new service options for vulnerable youth, youth residing in public housing developments with high crime rates, youth with disabilities, and youth at risk of gun violence. Enhance connections to school year learning and instruction by supporting new service models that offer youth more cohesive career development experiences. These models will provide participants with summer experience to complement the school year academic and after school activities and enable schools to give students summer enrichment activities including work experience. Implement a sector focused approach to align with New York City's career pathways approach and task force recommendations. DYCD continues to encourage opportunities in all sectors but is emphasizing connections and partnerships with high growth sectors including but not limited to technology, hospitality, real estate, fashion, culinary arts, media entertainment, business and professional services, health care, construction, transportation, and manufacturing. Based on the task force recommendations and the strategic changes DYCD anticipates making to SYP, D DYCD issued a SYP concept paper on September 13, 2017. We extended the comments one additional week until this Thursday, October 19th. 
We welcome all comments, so please submit them if you have not directly done so. The concept paper proposes three different SYP RFPs. The community-based SYP RFP will have three service options. Younger youth will meet the developmental needs of young youth ages 14 and 15 and provide them with en enriching career exploration and skills-based opportunities through project-based training. Older youth will meet the development needs of youth ages 16 to 21 and utilize a sector-focused approach that encompasses meaningful career exploration, college readiness, and exposure to post-secondary education options, work readiness training, and job placement in the relevant sectors. Ladders for Leaders is designed to help eligible youth ages 16 to 22 transition to the professional world of work through internships in growth sectors. The Special Initiatives RFP will have five service options. Year-round sector-focused programs is designed to strengthen connections between school year instruction and education with sector-based summer job opportunities for youth ages 16 to 24. Vulnerable youth is designed to meet the needs of vulnerable youth ages 14 to 24 and provide them with supports and work readiness skills to help them succeed. Vulnerable youth include homeless or runaway youth, uh, justice-involved youth, youth in, in or aging out of foster care, or youth in families who are receiving preventive services through New York City's Administration for Children's Services. SYP for the Mayor's Action Plan, MAP, for neighborhood safety is designed to expand um, access to career readiness as well as summer job opportunities for youth ages 14 to 24 residing in the 15 New York City Housing Authority NYCHA developments with some of the highest crime rates. Mayor de Blasio launched MAP in 2014 to reduce violence and make neighborhoods safer in and around the 15 NYCHA MAP developments. Youth with Disabilities is a service option to increase job opportunities among youth with disabilities ages 14 to 24. While this is a new specific service option, all SYP pro programs will continue to serve youth with cognitive, emotional, and physical disabilities. SYP for Cure Violence will provide skill building and work readiness programming for Cure Violence participants who are youth ages 14 to 24, most at risk of gun violence gang involvement and or, and or violence related arrests. Cure Violence is an evidence-based set of public health strategies to reduce gun violence operating in 17 police precincts across the city. Finally, the school-based SYPRP will fund programs designed to strengthen connections between academic learning and summer career exploration. Eligible participants at our youth ages 14 to 21 were enrolled in participating schools. Due to Mayor de Blasio's leadership, we have made tremendous progress in expanding SYP and supporting more young New Yorkers to gain the skills and workplace experiences that will support them to find stable and engagement, engaging employment as they transition to adulthood. The future of SYP is very bright as we seek to develop more specialized models to meet the unique employment and skill building needs of New York City's young people. We look forward to continued partnership with the City Council to ensure that the city's youth are well prepared to succeed in the labor force and contribute to the city's economy. Thank you again and uh, for the chance to testify today, and we welcome your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, in your testimony, you say that uh, you express that uh, we have been able, DYCD has been able to increase the number of youth service served by SYP. We have more young people who are involved in the program, 70,000, that's remarkable. And I commend you for that, and I commend the city council members, all of us, we work hard to make this happen. And I commend also the providers, that was uh, historic, as you know. And we are, this is a giant step in the right direction. We don't get there yet, you know, because we in the city council, we have been fighting and advocating for every single young person in New York City to have a job. And uh, we got to continue to work toward that because in the great city of New York, it makes sense that we provide to the young people the resources and the skills that they need to become the leaders of tomorrow. We say that all the time. 
And again, uh, I commend you and all the partners who work hard to make this possible to serve more young people, even we don't reach the number we want yet. But by increasing the number of the young people that benefit uh, from the SYP, what can you tell us about improving the quality also of the services of SYEP. Increasing the number is wonderful, but what steps have, have been taken to make sure that by increasing the number, we keep, we protect, or we improve the quality of the services that we are providing to the young people through SYEP? So let me uh, do the short-term response, and then long-term, I think, the quality will improve through the new models we're developing through the concept paper. But in the short term, one of the things that I think uh, everyone has taken for granted is the fact that the program didn't have stable funding. And, you know, I try to explain to my friends who don't work in government that you know, the summer youth employment program didn't have a final budget until the two weeks before the start of summer. And people kind of like, how does, why does government do that? And for 16 years, after the federal government uh, stopped funding the summer youth employment program, the budget dance, as you're very familiar with, always involved the summer youth employment program. And what that has real world consequences on the quality of a program because uh, when we find out uh, what the final budget is two weeks before the start of summer, there's a, a mad scramble by everyone, by, by the staff at DYCD, by the network of 100 programs to find job placements. Last year, this past summer, for the first time when we met in January with all the summer youth employment providers, we were able to tell them 80% of their budget, which is the city portion of it. And then by April, when the state adopted its budget, we kind of knew that allowed people to do outreach to employers much earlier than ever. They were able to do better matching. We actually had the application out earlier. So the more time to plan to do a, a match so that a young person is matched with a job that interests them, the better the quality experience, not only for the young person, but also for the employer. With the new models, uh, I think I'm hopeful that uh, once we do better alignment, and this is something I've always wanted to do, but you can't do it if you don't know how much money you have, so that when a young person uh, goes to school, like for example, a career and technical education school, and goes for a specific field, they can get a paid internship in that field. That's how I think we'll, we'll be able to make, take SYP to the next level of improvement. Uh, you mentioned, you know, uh, you talk a lot about the budget issue, right? But I remember in the past some public hearing, I always ask, in addition to the budget issue, the budget challenges, what are the other impact, other challenges or obstacles faced by DYCD in providing services to the young people? I always ask that. Right. It seems that the budget has been always the the key factor. Well, the other, I think, mean, one of the other challenges has been trying to convince uh, employers um, that are not nonprofits to be work sites for these young people. I think in the many, for many years until uh, this administration, uh, there was a deliberate uh, resistance uh, to work with private employers. Part of it, I think, is because the way the funding worked, you didn't know how many young people you, you, had, you had to place until two weeks before the start of summer. But we set a goal in 2014 to, uh, to uh, increase our, the number of young people by 5% a year, that, uh, the number of work sites that were private sector by 5% a year, and we fulfilled that. We went from 28% of the, of the work sites being private sector to now 45% of the work sites being private sector. And that takes time. That takes a lot of help from other city agencies, like the Center for Youth Employment, which has really helped to engage employers. They developed a manual uh, for employers on how how to work with young people. I mean, just as we had to um, expand the capacity of the nonprofit community on how to work with private employers, we have to also be mindful of the fact that employers uh, need to know how to work with young people. Most employers want a college intern. I mean, that's the bias. So when you're asking them to place a young person who's young as 14 or 15 or 16, it's more of a challenge. So that's something I think we're making steady progress with, and I think with the new models, I think we'll be able to, again, move that process even further along. 
You mentioned, you know, uh, a time frame of uh, two weeks before the beginning of SYP for the fund to be available or to make the, the decision. I think that, that has been always a concern for all of us in the city concern. If you remember uh, vividly when we were advocating to raise the number from 35,000 to where we are at right now, and the providers also you know, expressed concern about the time frame. Right. Even we increased the funding at that time, one of the concerns of the providers is the time frame. Right. They won't have enough time right. to strategize, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, strategize and to build up the program because this is not enough. Because even the money is available, they got to know how many young people, they will, the youth, they will be able to serve, how many empro employer, employees they need, how many, you know, uh, 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 seat uh, they need. So, but my, 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 my uh, thought is, and I said that in the previous, uh, you know, uh, uh, public hearing and even in press conferences, why don't we start planning from the beginning? instead of waiting from the last time. Well, so... Because uh, if we start planning earlier, right. we will be able to do a better job and it will be better for the providers also. Every year is the same thing. So why don't we start, you know, at the very beginning? We finish the budget right now. Let's get ready. Let's come together, you know, as uh, providers, of, as servants of young people. I mean, city council members, DYCD, the mayor office, service providers... Let's come together and start planning for the next budget. So I agree with you. In fact, for the last four years, we've started earlier than ever in history. In fact, uh, the joke uh, going on at DYCD is um, three years ago, our first meeting was uh, a week before the snowstorm in January because we know to do a quality program, even though it's six weeks, you need six months of preparation. The missing piece, which finally came into place uh, when the money was baseline was we knew how much money because uh, we would start meeting in January but we wouldn't be able to tell a program how much money they had to work with. That's crazy. I agree with you. But this year uh, in January when we convened the 100 programs we told them this is 80% of your budget when the state adopts its, its money in April. So by April everyone knew how much money they had to work with we started the application for our programs earlier than ever. Ladders for Leaders uh, this year, because uh, we, we know that's a high drop-off rate. Young people apply, but they're offered multiple jobs. We, I think it was released in October of last year. This year, we released the summer youth employment application a month early. So there was a good three months of time from the time young people were selected to place young people. So that's important. I agree with you because if you don't, if you rush the process, it's not going to benefit the young person and it's not going to benefit the employer. What's happened in the past uh, when, when we had a situation of the, of the budget dance, when you get the funding two weeks before the start of summer, many of the young people who got selected for summer jobs ended up working in summer camp. Now, the summer camp experience is a great experience, but we want to give young people a diverse range of options, and the more we can align it with what they're interested in, the better. So, uh, you know, I, I commend again, <coughs> excuse me, DYCD and all the wonderful people who are part of uh, the effort to serve, you know, disconnected youth uh, and also uh, uh, disadvantaged youth and vulnerable young people. But... Uh, also, your, the effort of DYCD to include more service providers also. This is very important because uh, yeah, we know that there are many companies and many institutions with great people, people with skill and good heart. Who, they want to be part of what we are doing for the young people. Right. This is remarkable. But could you tell us how you select them? What is your process to select the, 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 the service providers in the private sectors? Well, let me uh, say a few words, and then Andre can talk a little bit more of how it's worked in the past. So I agree with you that, um, you know, again, it's always good to have perspective on these things. And so when the last time the city did an RFP for SYP, the baseline number of jobs was 23,000. 23,000. So the 100 programs we selected to run the program today they were originally being asked to serve 23,000 young people. This upcoming RFP, the baseline number is 70,000. 
So we've asked an awful lot of the network of community groups to triple, almost more than triple the number of young people they served. And so part of our strategy is to bring on new providers so that we can share the load and the responsibility. Because we know there's a, there's a limit to how many young people uh, can get quality experiences if, if you have so many uh, in one provider. So part of what we want to do, and we've been actively engaging uh, a host of agencies that don't run summer youth employment program to uh, encourage them to consider applying. For example, um, uh, we want to grow the program that serves homeless, foster care, and uh, 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 court-involved youth. And so there are many groups out there working with homeless youth. We, we run, as you know, the runaway homeless youth programs in the city. And so we, we're reaching out to them to say, hey, you may want to apply for this because this is a great wraparound service to the services you're already providing. Or, as you know, we have 94 cornerstone community centers in public housing. And since we have um, money dedicated to provide summer jobs in certain high crime uh, public housing developments, uh, we're encouraging them to consider. So you're absolutely right. We need to like grow the universe of people who provide the service. 101 is not enough. Uh, Want to add? So I think what's what's really important for us, as the commissioner mentioned, for, uh, just your name for the record, please. Oh, Andre White, Associate Commissioner, Youth Workforce Development Programs. Um, as you know, we, we're going to be releasing a new RFP for programs beginning next year, and I think we've been very, very intentional around how is it that we get new providers into the fold. So to give you some examples, for the past two to three months, myself and my, my team and the commissioner has been meeting with various nonprofit groups across the city to ensure that folks are aware that this RFP is going to be coming up beyond the group of providers we have now, right? Because we do understand that based on the capacity what we have now, we need more folks um, to come on board to run the program. Uh, 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 one of the questions that I asked, you know, uh, previously is the quality of services that we are providing through SYP. Uh, we know that there are a lot of uh, providers, a lot of participants, you know, businesses and, uh, and non-for-profit organizations. What can you tell us about the coordination? How you coordinated the, you know, the, the, the job, the, the participation of those uh, service providers, but especially communication, working together to ensure that, you know, everything is done properly and to make sure that you can get an idea what do they need to do a better, better job to, to reach the goal that we are all, you know, looking for, better serve the young people, make sure that the young people benefit from that. Is there any participation from them, you know, when you take the decision and decision making, is there any follow-up that DYCD do? to reach out to those providers and say, ah, the program is going. Is there any need? You know, do you have everything that you well, need to, for, to serve the young people? What I, are your challenges? Right. No, uh, I can start and then Andre can yeah. talk about it. Uh, the, um, I think there's a strong partnership between uh, the DYCD staff and the community-based organizations running the program. Uh, besides the monthly meetings, there are often uh, daily communications, either by phone or by email. There are regular site visits because uh, this program won't work unless it works for them. And so t it's uh, the credit of the DYCD staff and to the s staff of the nonprofits. They've done a Herculean job of really growing this program with last minute funding. So um, you want to talk a little bit more? Or yeah. not? So again, we. We have what's called an open door policy for our providers, right, across all our workforce programs, actually across all our programs at DYCD. Um, and within the SYP division, each CBO is assigned what we call a program manager. And that program manager is responsible for ensuring that the CBO has all the resources necessary that they need to run the program successfully. But beyond that, we also provide capacity building services. So if we recognize that the CBO might be experiencing issues with job development, for example, right, we have a contractor that we have on board, which is a workforce professional training institute that comes on to really assist that provider with kind of developing jobs, right? Teaching them, giving them the tools necessary to be able to do that. Whatever issues those providers are experiencing, folks at DYC, they are there to address them, whether or not it's internal or external. The second thing that we really, really try to do is to ensure that 
providers have a very open and honest conversation with us when they're having any sort of issue, right? Some conversations sometimes might be difficult, but we want to hear the difficult conversation because collectively we have to work together to resolve whatever issues a provider might be facing because ultimately they're the ones on the ground running the program. So I think it's important to understand that there's an open door policy and there's also additional resources um, that we provide in terms of capacity building for, for the groups that might need it. Talking about the uh, youth with disability, with special needs, let's say, for example, uh, vulnerable young people or disconnected, homeless young people. We know that those uh, young people, they are young people with very special needs, very special needs, especially some of the time, a lot of uh, challenges in their families. And uh, if you don't have a safe haven, a safe place, in your family, and you don't have a, a family where the needs are fulfilled, regardless of what you do in life, it's going to be a big challenge. I'm talking about those young people who have uh, 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 trouble or challenges in their families uh, because they don't have a place to live, because mommy and daddy cannot you know, provide them with uh, the education that they need. And could you tell us... Uh, what are the, uh, the specificity or the special services right. or the effort that DYCD is doing to fulfill the needs of those very special uh, target population? So th that's one of the exciting parts of the concept paper, and, and we hope to be in the RFP, is the special initi initiatives section, which understands that one size does not fit all, that... Um, the needs of a young person who may be homeless, court-involved, who might be caught up with gang violence, or who might have a disability, that you need specialized services and providers who know how to work with these young people. So I'll give you one example of um, how uh, in the current model we're, we're getting better at serving homeless youth. Um, a couple of years ago, I had a chance to um, go to a meeting at the Broom Street Academy, which is a charter school um, operated by the door, and half the young people who attend this high school are homeless. That's part of their mission. And I didn't know they existed, and I thought, what a great potential partnership. So the last two summers, uh, they've been a great partner with our SYP program. They've screened young people, identified those that are ready to work, and I think two or three hundred young people each summer from their student population, it's a very small high school, have gotten guaranteed summer jobs. Because we recognize that the more we can provide specialized services, the more we can connect with people who know how to work with young people with unique challenges, the better. But you want to talk about the our concept paper? Yeah, absolutely. So within, within the concept paper, as the commissioner mentioned, there's a special initiative um, section, right? And we were very intentional around carving out these different groups because we recognize each young person along the development continuum is very different. It, for example, a young person with disability, the services that you provide would be very different from a young person who might be um, runaway or homeless or in the foster care system. So what we, the, the intent there is to really get groups who are very, very good at working with these young people in whatever area they're specializing in, right? I like to say our current providers are generalists, right? They're good at job development, placing young people in jobs, providing support and wraparound services, but they might not necessarily have the skill sets necessary to work with of specialized groups. So I think it was very important to us to recognize that there's that gap, and we want to ensure that the groups that know to work with these young people are aware of the RFP, what would apply to the RFP, and bring the skills necessary to work with these young people so they, they could have a meaningful summer job experience. <clears throat> when I mentioned that, uh, when I asked you to talk about the, you know, the, the different effort that has been made to fulfill the need of the uh, uh, vulnerable or disconnected young people. Uh, I was thinking about the training of the staff, the staff who are engaged in WOL and SYP serving those young people. What type of training that they receive? What type of you know, qualification that they have? Let's say, for example, uh, troubled youth. They are already in trouble. They need people who understand you know, their situation, people with skill that can address you know, their the, the issues. Let's say, for example, young people in gang. This is a big issue, big issue. 
I'm talking about that because for somebody who have been serving young people for about 15 years, thousand people, they are really in trouble. I know that there have been a lot of money, a lot of funding available for that, a lot of wonderful people, great people, they have been doing any effort that they can do to see if they can resolve that. But this is a big issue. Let's say, for example, language barrier. We know that many young people, they come from families, immigrant families from all over the world. And unfortunately, some of the time, they are facing also the, the cultural barrier. We know that, language barrier. So what exactly DYCD is doing to make sure that DYCD has not only good people, people with heart, dedicated people, but those people they have the tool they need, the training they need to address those issues. Let's say, for example, I was watching the TV, I think it was yesterday or this morning, very quick, and I saw a young girl talking about, you know, upset offended, humiliated that she is because the teacher said that she has to speak English, something like that. She speaks Spanish, and she was devastated. This is the type of, you know, the thing that I'm talking about. So to understand that those young people, they are special people, they have different needs, how we can come together and give to our, our service, not service providers, but the people who are serving the young people, the skill and the tool they need to make sure that the, the service they are rendering to the young people is excellent. So central to all the programs that we designed at DYC is, is the expectation that there is cultural competency, that people who seek funding from us have to demonstrate the ability to work with diverse uh, communities. And we have, I think, pretty good coverage in communities across the city of New York serving different ethnicities. Uh, so that's an important uh, value of DYCD. But, you know, we also recognize the city is constantly changing, and so we're constantly looking for ways to reach underserved communities. So I'll give you an example. Um, the last two summers, um, I've uh, gone on Bengal Bengali television to, to talk about the Summer Youth Employment Program, because that's a, a growing community that has not been served by the Summer Youth Employment Program. I did a visit um, in Queens uh, early this year of the Tibetan Youth Center. And uh, we fund an after-school program with the Tibetan Youth Center. And there's a growing Tibetan community in uh, Queens, and I believe it's Astoria. And um, I told them about the Summer Youth Employment Program. And they said, oh, we know about it because we work with HANEC, a Greek organization. Right. And they place uh, young people who are Tibetan through the uh, uh, HANEC some youth employment program. So I think there's a strong commitment uh, uh, by DYCD and, and all the nonprofits that uh, we fund to serve a diverse uh, segment of New York City. On the issue of dis disconnected youth, we uh, fund um, uh, separately a lot of programs uh, throughout the school year for young people who are not in the workforce, not in school. And so what we're trying to do now is young people, and the Summer Youth Employment Program is open to anyone, regardless of whether they're in school or not. So we're getting better at doing um, referrals. So when a young person comes into the Summer Youth Employment Program, may not be in school, but they've gotten their first work experience in the Summer Youth Employment Program, there's a connection, and they're referred to the other um, programs that we fund so that we can build on the SYP experience. Yeah, that, listen, uh, there are certain issues, you know, facing young people. They are very, very complicated and serious issues that require, you know, uh, collaboration, working together. Let me mention bullying, for example. Bullying in school and the street all over the place in New York City is a big issue. We all can remember that two young people were stabbed by another young people because of a bullying situation. And I think that as a city, as a society, probably we may have an opportunity to come together to address the, the, this type of issues. So, for example, uh, DYCD, does DYCD offer some type of you know, peaceful conflict resolution, you know, and the training that, you know, and the services, because if the young people don't know how to address issues, you know, a conflict, even we provide them with jobs, with everything, but we will fail to help them become successful and also to understand that to succeed, there are certain, you know, behavior that they should have. 
Is there any conflict resolution, peaceful conflict resolution uh, training uh, course? So and I'll other, start. And other, you know, uh, appropriate uh, training that will help the young people, you know, uh, be able to address issues or conflict. So I'll start, because I know a big part of the Serum Youth Employment uh, Program is an orientation for every young person who's given a job. And Andre will go into a lot of what's provided in that uh, orientation session. But I know a big thing that we emphasize with many young people is self-advocacy, that they have to speak up for themselves. Uh, it's an important skill, and I know this personally because we've gotten complaints from young people about particular work sites. And the, many times we investigate and the complaints are legitimate and we uh, remove the work site because they're either asking young people to do inappropriate work or there's other issues of safety and health. So self-advocacy is something we, it's ingrained in the design of the program because we want young people to have self-respect for themselves and for where they work. But Andre will talk a little bit about what, what's covered in the orientation. So within the program, we have a standardized curriculum that covers six core areas that we focus on um, from career readiness training, college exploration, financial literacy, um, health education. Under the health education umbrella, there's a section within the curriculum that really focuses on how do you deal with conflict in the workplace, right? As you know, a lot of these young people, sometimes it's their first time working or they might not necessarily know how to deal with conflict. So there's a very comprehensive section where providers are responsible for delivering um, these, this particular topic to young people. Um, what we have seen over the years, and I think I'm, I will say for the most part, a lot of young people, when they show up to their work sites for the most part, perform well, right? They show up on time, they, they listen to their supervisors, they execute what they, have, what they have to execute, and I think a lot of this <coughs> has to do with the training that the providers provide before they're actually placed at the job. Um, is that going to resolve every issue at the work site? No, it's not, but for the most part, we've, rec we've recognized that the training has been useful based on what the providers have been giving young people. <coughs> Again, I, I may say that the, uh, the SYP is a wonderful program, wonderful program, helping so many young people. And I, I used to speak to even uh, elected officials, uh, successful uh, professionals right now. They are still talking about the opportunities that they had to go through the uh, and SYP. This is a wonderful program. But uh, you just mentioned that uh, part of the program is... Uh, College, college inspiration. But what about, we know that uh, there are many young people who won't be in college, many of them, for many reasons. Not because they don't want to, not because they are not qualified, but there are many reasons why a young person, you know, uh, won't have the opportunity to go to college. So is there anything available for them also to prepare them to succeed on, on life? Because we prepare them to go to college. What about those who won't have the opportunity to go to college and who are part of the SYP? What is available you know, for them in case or within the SYP program, do you have any type of uh, approach to identify or to try to figure out those who won't be able to do, go to college, even I know that it's difficult, or to offer all of them the option you know, the opportunities to be prepared for college and also to be prepared to succeed in life even if they don't go to college. So let me start with uh, something that, a new approach that we've adopted and we're moving ahead full steam on, which is how to integrate services at DYCD. In the past, what would happen is, um, you know, the summer youth employment program would be here, the after school program would be there, the literacy program would be there, and they didn't talk to each other. And so we made it a goal of DYCD over the next, uh, over the last three years is to make it easier for people to access multiple services. Because when, it, you're right, when a young person or when a family comes to a DYCD funded program, they usually have more than one issue. And the easier we make it to connect them to other services in the same neighborhood, we're doing that. We have a new app, for example, called Discover DYCD. It just won an award by New York State as the best uh, app for use by the public. It allows a person to just type in their address and they can find out what services DYCD funds in that neighborhood. So a young person who may want a literacy program can connect to that service. Uh, a young person who may want um, you know, other services that when they exit SYP 
can uh, access services. And as I said earlier, we're making a much more a rigorous effort to, when a young person exits the program, and another door opens. Because you're right, not every young person is ready to go to college. Sometimes they have to do other things before they can afford college. So we're, we're, this new strategy of integrating services is how we want to make sure we're using every dollar well. Okay, let me ask, uh, uh, let me say that we have been joined by Council Member David Greenfield. He left, but he will return very soon. And we have been joined also by Council Member Margaret Chin. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, in terms of uh, disconnected youth or youth uh, with uh, uh, trouble or, or issues, we know that the most of the challenges, a problem facing those young people come from the families, most of them, because they are a broken family, there are issues in the family. Do you have any type of uh, you know, program or approach working together with the parents to try to address the issues that they're facing the family in order to ensure that uh, the, the, the uh, SYEP services are more successful? Is well, there any communication or well, working yeah. together with the parents? I think many of the programs, particularly ones that serve young, younger youth, those that are 14 or 15, have much more active engagement with the parents. As young, young people get older, as you know, they become uh, more detached from their parents and stuff. So I think uh, parental involvement is always in, uh, part of the recruitment process. Parents, are very, uh, parents of younger youth are very involved in the selection. I know um, just one personal example. Um, a uh, person who works for me, she took the day off because her 14-year-old her son got his first summer job and she wanted to make sure everything went off well. And so that's part of how we encourage the nonprofit agencies to involve the parents. I think it's become a little easier now that the funding is uh, more certain, so you're not rushing at the last minute to place a young person. You have some <clears throat> sense, if you've selected a young person in the spring, to involve the parents in, in the summer experience, especially if it's their first summer job. <clears throat> I mean, how many uh, disconnected youth were served? What happened to the disconnected youth after SYEP ended? So, uh, yeah. Andre can talk about some of the programs that serve disconnected youth. Yeah. So during the SYEP process, we do what we call a deep assessment, right, in terms of figuring out if a young person is going back to school or what the transition is going to be post SYP for those young people who have no connection to any form of formal education training or a job opportunity we then provide a listing of opportunities that they could actually think about internally at DYCD we have a number of programs targeted towards young people who are not in school not working our OSY program which is out of school youth program is geared towards young people ages 16 to 24 who's not in school not working and we provide vocational training for those young people along with some HSC prep right there's also a component that we included last year where young people actually get an internship opportunity and they could work up to 150 hours a week. Um, there's also the Young Adult Internship Program, which is an internship program for 12 weeks, again, geared towards young people who are not in school, not working. Typically, I would say 50% of those young people have already attained the high school diploma, and they're engaged in an internship for 14 weeks, and the provider is then responsible to connect them to a job or connect them to some sort of advanced training or an educational program. And there's also nine months of follow-up that happens after they exit that program to ensure that they're getting the support that they need to be successful. Um, there's also the Young Adult Literacy Program, which is geared towards the young people, again, who are disconnected, not in school, not working, but obviously want to work on their literacy, um, want to work on literacy abilities to make sure that they're able to pass the tape test and go on to do the HSC and eventually get placed in some sort of formal training. Um, and we also have the YAP Plus program, which is in partnership with ACS, where we provide internship opportunities for young people who are in the foster care system or in the juvenile justice system as well. So there's an array of programs that we provide. There's a menu that young people could select from based on their needs or where they are in their life. Yeah, you're talking about the program, but how many are those disconnected youth? How many are there? You're, you're, I'm sorry, you're asking me how many... I, I mean in the SYP program, how many are disconnected youth? Oh, so right now, most of our... Dis between 
21 to 24. 20? No, no, no. I'm trying to explain to you, SYP goes up to age 24, right? Between that age bracket, 21 to 24, there's roughly 3,000 young people in that age bracket. 50,000? 3,000. 3,000? Right, of which a percentage of that number of those young people are disconnected. I could get back to you guys with that specific number, but it's not a large number of young people. 80% of the young people that participate in SYP are actually in school, right? Um, in high school, I should say, or the large majority um, go back to some sort of training, whether it's college or some sort of educational program. We, we recognize that a young person who's not in school, not in work, needs more than a six-week job. That's why uh, the uh, four or five programs that uh, Andre talked about are year-round programs because um, if you're not in school and not in work, you need a lot more help. And a job sometimes is just the final piece of the puzzle. You need, uh, you need help getting a GED. You need case management services. Right. And that's why the Young Adult Internship Program, the Out of School Youth Program, the, uh, all these other programs that we have to ge that are geared to the special needs of disconnected youth are, are better fit and then if they're ready for a summer youth employment program, they can apply. But sometimes the SYP is the end of the process, not the beginning for them. But those disconnected, 2,000 young uh, disconnected youth, were they referred to other organi organization or other program at the end of the program? Yeah, there, can, every young person who exits who's disconnected is connected to other services because we want to build on this one experience, and that's been the the challenge in the past is that SYP was a separate program. It didn't connect to other programs. And so with a new data system, with an easier referral system, a young person uh, who exits the program will at least be able to know what other services they can uh, access. Could you mention some of the programs that were referred to? Um, they were the ones that Andre just went over. You want us to repeat? Yeah, could, could you repeat them for me? So it's the Out of School Youth Program. Uh, the school youth program, OSY program, the YIP, the Young Adult Internship Program, the YALP, which is the Young Adult Literacy Program, YIP Plus, which is in, corp um, in partnership with um, ACS. So those are sort of like the big buckets internally at DYC, but also we refer folks to the Workforce One centers that is run and operated by SVS. We can send you the list, okay? Would that be helpful with the description? So what about all the uh, uh, private organization and other institution? The what? I'm sorry. Do you refer them to other institution or private institution, businesses, oh, so or you, other, other non-profit organization? So as I said in my testimony, uh, there's been a three-year campaign to expand the involvement of the private sector in the summer youth employment program. And you know, at, at one point, the city deliberately didn't reach out to employers. So with the help of the, summer, of the Center for Youth Employment, we've really increased the number so that 45% of the 12,000 plus work sites last year were in the private sector. And they run the gamut. They run from Odell's, which for three consecutive summers has made every uh, store in New York City a work site to uh, small mom and pop businesses in the community. So I think you know, uh, there's a strong commitment by, by this administration to engage the private sector in, in employing young people, whether they're in school, or whether they're disconnected youth. Some providers have indicated that 14 and 15 years old may be disconnected from applying to the younger youth program if it's only paid. 700 stipend. Was this concern highlighted by youth who participated in the SYP this summer? So let's take a step back. The, the goal of the, the younger youth model that we're proposing in the new concept paper is really to ensure that young people become work ready, right? What we have seen over the years, those young people ages 14 and 15, they're not work ready. So when you place them at, with an employer, for the most part, the employer feels as if they're babysitting, right? They don't feel as if they're getting the necessary skills that they would expect from an intern throughout the summer. So with that said, it was important to develop certain competencies that young people would need to be successful in the workplace. And the best 
best approach that we have seen, not only locally but across the country, is to have them engage in project-based learning opportunities. And the focus there is really work readiness training, right? So covering topics from how do you um, write a resume, right? How do you interview? What are your ex what are your expectations? What are expectations when you get into a job, right? What are your responsibility in terms of getting there on time, right? And making sure that young people understand these different elements because it's important for them to be successful at any job. Um, and over the years, that has not been really successful with, with, with the younger youth, right? So I think it's important just to get them in a the classroom, making sure that they acquire these skills, and hopefully after two years, they'll be ready to be placed with an employer. Um, in terms of the stipend issue, we did a pilot this summer, as you know, with the Career Clue program. Um, the young people are really engaged. They really enjoyed being a part of the pilot. Um, they appreciated getting a stipend. That was not, definitely not an issue for the young people that we work with. They were really more ex um, excited about the experience and the ability to work on the projects that they worked on. Councilmember Greenfield is back. I want to give him the opportunity to ask some questions, and I will get back to you later on, guys. Councilmember Greenfield. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. So I, I appreciate uh, all that you folks are doing. I know it's sort of uh, the issue of the summer youth employment program. It's sort of a moving target, and it's a challenge to sort of uh, try to make sure it's working as efficiently. I, I guess I just want to understand, just for starters, right now my understanding is that for, well, why don't I ask you, how many applicants right now versus how many folks you're able to put into the Summer Youth Employment Program? As it stands right now, the last so, summer. So uh, this summer, we received over 147,000 applications. We were able to place 69,718 young people in jobs. You received how many applications? 147,000. Okay, so around 40% roughly? No, yeah. almost a, a little, Yeah, a little bit more, yeah. Give or take? Right. <laughs> okay. Well, and the other uh, factor is that there's a huge drop-off. To fill the 69,000 jobs, we have to make many more job offers because young people decline. Okay. And so it's, fair. it's, uh, so it's, not, uh, it's not a simple math that... It wasn't necessarily the correlation. Some people apply, they don't necessarily aren't going to show up at work, but there definitely is, there are additional people that would like to attend versus the slots that exist. But is a that... much smaller number than half. Okay, that's fair. Um, the point, I guess, I guess, is that right now, that for every one, pers for every one slot, there's one point something people I... that would like to fill that slot. Yes? Right. Okay, so the system right now is pretty popular and one would argue pretty successful. It's your system. I'm arguing it's pretty successful, Commissioner. Yeah, no, so no, this is a good no, thing to agree with. Yeah, it's, and I think the most. If I was a commissioner and a councilman said we have a successful yeah. program, I, mean, I, think the I would chalk it up and say, yes, thank you, councilman. Yeah, so it's, it's success attracts interest. And so I think the, the important thing about the Summer Youth Employment Program that, again, historical perspective is important. When it operated at what was then the Department of Employment, there was an artificial cap on the number of applications. They would print 60,000 applications, and that was it. Yeah. Uh, when the program moved to DYCD, we were one of the first city services that moved to an online application. So when you make it easier to apply, more people apply, and then more people will say, I'm interested, and then we'll drop out. So that's why I think the drop-off is important, because it doesn't necessarily mean that every young person who applied wanted a job. It was like their plan B if their <coughs> summer job didn't come through. So it's been successful, and I think we've made a lot of progress in not only serving more young people, but increasing the engagement of the private sector. They're kids. It's the first time that they're applying for a job. In many cases, sometimes they don't show up. I get it. It happens in my office, too. We get interns, and they come through the process, and they apply, and they're really excited. And then a week before, they find out that their buddy's going on vacation, and there went their excitement for the job working in Councilman Greenfield's office. Now, I happen to think working in my office for eight weeks is a better gig than traveling Europe, but some people <laughs> would disagree with really? me. But I certainly, I certainly hear that. So that's good. I'm not, it's not a criticism. I certainly understand that. And I think that the point that I'm making is that right now it's a relatively successful program. You have a lot of people who want to participate. We're getting generally good feedback. Now, 
the proposal, as I understand it, seems to have some very significant changes. I'm just trying to understand why it is, you know, sort of the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And normally in this body, we're turning around and yelling and screaming and saying, this isn't working, this is horrible. And now you guys are coming and saying, we have a successful program, we're making some tweaks at the edges, which is both for the 14 and 15 year olds and also for the older youth. So can we break it down and sort of get a better understanding of why are we making the changes for 14, 15 year olds? It seems to me, just based on the data that I have, that that's always been a challenging population, right? Similar to the issues that we discussed, which is when you're 14 and 15, unfortunately, you don't have the same interests as a 17, 18, 19, and 20 year old. And then on the flip side, what are we doing in terms of uh, in terms of the age cap on the other end? So can you just give me a little more clarity on on how that's going to work and what you're trying to achieve and what your experience has been? specifically with the 14, 15 year olds as it relates to the community service class education model. So a lot of the, uh, the proposed changes came through as a result of the uh, city council and mayor task force that met last year, begin to take a fresh look at these programs. So the 14, 15 year old, uh, Andre can talk a little bit about, but it's a lot of based on meeting the needs of young people where they're at. As you know, you know it's, it's, it's a challenge to find a job for a 14-year-old. In fact, even to work in a summer camp, you have to be at least 15. So, it's, the, so we don't want babysitting. We want it to be a meaningful pre-employment experience so that young people can really enter the workforce with a certain basic knowledge skill. Um, as far as the um, Older, uh, oh, Commissioner, I'm sorry. Before we get to that, I just want to clarify, because maybe I'm just not understanding this correctly. My understanding is that we're moving away from a, the model of the 14, 15 year olds where we're going to have more hands on experience to less hands on. We're moving away from that model to a closer to, I guess, what we would call group activities. Is that my misunderstanding that? I would is that say not we're my moving understanding? away from babysitting, which is what we've heard from employers, is that what do I have a 14 year old do that will add value? to my experience as an employer. I mean, that's a, a real challenge. That, Always uh, frustrating for me. When I was a lawyer, my 14-year-olds weren't drafting my legal papers. I hear yes. that. Yeah. So, so, yes. so, so, we wanted, so I think one of the unintended That was uh, a joke, Commissioner, by the way, just so oh. that you know. For the record, I've never asked my 14-year-olds to draft legal papers. Part of it, you know, they show up, they sit, they experience, they see, they come to meetings, you know, they make coffee. Like, it's kind of like part of the... Part of the job, right? I mean, yeah, well, do, maybe, yeah. maybe it might be helpful if Andre talked a little bit about the pilot experience with LAMP this, this yeah. summer and what we got out of that experience because that really has informed a lot of the thinking. Yeah. All right, let's break it up. I just want to focus on both of the extremes first. So the 14 and 15 year old, why are we moving more from what we would, what I am calling a hands on work experience and you're calling the baby sitting model? Why are we, why are we changing that? So, yeah. so I think it's important to understand that, um, and I'll, I was the SYP director for five years, right? I've been at DYCD for a very long time. And one of the, the things we recognize, providers would always have severe difficulty developing meaningful jobs for young people ages 14 to, and 15 years old. Um, in fact, when we would get funding two weeks before the program would start, right, we have to allocate additional slots. One of the pushback I would get from providers year after year, I would take additional slots for the older youth, but I will not take additional slots for the younger youth because I can't develop jobs for them. And if I do develop jobs for them, they're not going to be good, meaningful jobs, right? So that's something I've experienced myself. And, you know, as we think about SYP and the direction that we're moving in, we want to ensure that we're, we're creating a program that young people could benefit from in the long term, right? We want to ensure that they're developing and acquiring skills that they could utilize after they leave the program. So the project-based learning project opportunity program so it sounds like a mouthful, um, is really ensuring that young people work together, right? Team building, right? Understanding the, the different things that you need to learn to be successful in the workplace. A lot of them are green. At 14, they don't even understand what, what a resume is, what a cover letter is, right? So we want to make sure 
that they understand those different pieces before we place them into a job. And just to talk a little bit about our experience this summer with a pilot, the Career Clue pilot in conjunction with, with DOE, which was fairly successful. And young people were engaged in projects around energy consumption, right? Um, they had the ability to work in different projects, to propose different ideas, um, work in groups. They did presentations to folks at the mayor's office. They were very engaged. They got a stipend. But more importantly, it built their confidence, right? They were able to do presentations, right? They were also able to develop resumes and write cover letters and, and be able to be prepared for a more like intense sort of job opportunity when, that's, when that presents itself. I don't know. Color me skeptical. I'll tell you why. I think what you're describing essentially is um, uh, some sort of watered-down version of school for kids. I'm just being blunt to give you my perspective, right? When I was 14, I was a junior counselor. When I was 15, I was a counselor. And guess what? I had no idea and didn't learn how to write a resume until I was 21. And I turned out okay. Uh, not everybody would say I turned out great. It sort of depends on what side of the political spectrum you're at. But most people would say I turned out okay. <laughs> and I think the point is that I'm making is that that, you know, it's very easy to do what you're doing in a pilot program, which is to get a particular corporation or an organization to focus and to say, wow, let's make something really cool and exciting, but mostly that doesn't happen. And there are traditional opportunities, such as, for example, being a camp counselor or a junior counselor or a waiter, where it may be more fun and less, you know, academic. And I'm a little bit concerned, honestly, that you're, you're rigging the system towards the 14 and 50 year olds really just to those who, let's call it, are more academic or higher IQ or more uh, experience interested rather than folks who are just looking for a job. My other concern is that it seems to me, once again, if I'm making a mistake on either one of these because it's a complicated uh, concept paper, I'm not an expert and you guys are, so please let me know. It seems to me that you're also reducing a stipend as well, right? Whereas this year the stipend for the similar work or that program would have been higher and the stipend is getting lower, right? So it's sort of like a, a double whammy in the sense that, so now a 14-year-old has to be, A, more academically interested and more wonky to go in to meet with some, like, really cool, I don't know, I mean, God bless these 14-year-olds, but I don't know a lot of 14-year-olds who are like, I really want to learn about alternative energy and hang out and do, like, solar panels all summer. And then that's A. And then B, are we getting paid less to do that? So I'm a little bit concerned, honestly, that, you know, I think that we're in, in our quest to perfection, we might be harming the good, which is that if I have a kid, this is my view, and once again, I'm, I'm not the expert that you are, and I'm not an academic. I just look at it from a real-world perspective of somebody who's the father of three boys. If I have a 14-year-old kid who wants to work in the summer, I'm pretty happy, right? If my 14-year-old wants to work and do a job, quite frankly, if that job involves making coffee, I'm very pleased, honestly, as a father. I do not need my child to have, like, mega experience. And if my child is making twice as much money, which I can tell you for 14-year-olds is a very big deal, uh, then and making half. So essentially what I'm saying is, hey, my dear 14-year-old, next summer, good news, you're going to get to hang out with a bunch of folks and you're going to wear a sweater vest and a tie and you're going to come in and you're going to write concept papers and at the end of the summer you're going to get to write a resume. I don't know, I would think a very high percentage of kids would be like, no thanks, I'm going to go skateboarding instead versus, and you're going to get paid half, then as opposed to just hang out and be like a junior counselor or a waiter or uh, assistant lifeguard or even the kid, quite frankly, who makes coffee. I, 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 once again, I know some people are going to say this isn't as high-minded as it should be, and I get it. It's just like when we say every single, every single person should go to college and get a graduate degree in professional, but it's just not the reality of the world that we work in. And if you're asking me the, youth, the, the value of the youth, taking a kid off the street to me, has a value that's more than simply saying, well, let's make sure we're getting every bang for our buck. So I'm just being blunt. I'm very concerned about that. I think that we're sort of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, to borrow, borrow a term from my Christian friends. I think that you have a generally good concept, and in the effort to improve it, I'm afraid you're throwing out the, the broader concept, which is that the main purpose of summer youth employment, in my view, is to get kids a job. It doesn't have to be a perfect job, but it's a job. Let me tell you something. My first year that I was a waiter, I screwed up a lot, and I got yelled at a lot, and I didn't make a lot of money, but it was a good experience, and I learned from that. And then when I became a junior counselor, it was the same thing. When I became a counselor, all those experiences helped me. And I'm telling you, this is not an exaggeration, I did not know how to write a cover letter until I was 20 or 21 years old. And that's okay, because those aren't the experiences that every single 14-year-old needs. Some kids are going to be Mensa kids, which is, in my view, what you're shooting for over here, the 14-year-olds who can write the cover letters and who can have the great 
brilliant ideas and we can feature on 60 Minutes who really came up with this really clever idea on how to save the world. Other kids are going to kind of be like me, right? You know, which is, I don't know, I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing this summer. Am I going to hang out with my friends and just, you know, go out and, you know, back in the day it was a little bit less risque. So, you know, maybe you went out and played arcades. I don't know what the young kids are doing today. Mm. Versus, am I going to go and actually get a job and have some people yell at me and I'm probably going to screw up, but you know what? I'll make a few bucks and I'll get some experience. So, I'm weighing in on the side of the young kids who are not as super talented or charismatic, who don't own the sweater vests and the ties and the button-down shirts, and who could use that experience. I'm asking you to reconsider that, to think about those 14 and 15-year-olds who really could just use a job, any job, and if that job just means that they're in an office and there's air conditioning, and even if they're surfing the web most of the day, and they're making some coffee, and they end up showing up in court if they're working for a law firm, and they're getting some experience, and even if it's not perfect, I think there's a value in that, too. So I'm just making that argument on the first piece. So can you explain to me on the second piece in terms of the upper age what it is that you guys are looking to do? Okay, so, so we'll certainly share your feedback on the 14, 15 year olds. I appreciate you know, it. That's why we this, have these this, hearings. This was not like, uh, this is a very thoughtful process that a lot of different people weighed in, including the people who actually provide the service. On the older age, Oh, I understand. I just think, once again, I'm just pointing out, I think that the people who are weighing in are perhaps a little too smart for their own well, good. Well, some of this came I'm out speaking, of the task force meeting. I understand. So. I'm just speaking on behalf of right. the, 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 the youth. Right. To, uh, uh, to quote from one of my favorite films, the youth who aren't necessarily here. Do you know which film I'm referring to? So on the upper age yes, group, in the, in the task force yeah. meetings, this also came up, that there was a consensus among many of the people who were at the task force that yes. the key age group was 16 to 21, that that was the group that, uh, and historically it's represented the largest percentage of young people. The number of young people 21 to 24 was really only 3,000, and that age limit was raised in 2009? Yeah, yeah nine. It was actually a decision made by the previous administration, because for many years, for most of the 60, 50-some-odd years of SYP, the age range was 14 to 21. Yeah. In 2009, uh, the federal government um, added, uh, made available what was called federal stimulus money, ARA, and some youth employment was able to tap into it, but it said that you had to serve young people up to, up to 24. Yeah. So that, that was a, uh, the additional three years was added as a result of federal money that went away five or six years ago. So the consensus among um, many of the people in the task force was let's focus on the sweet spot, which is the 16 to 21 age group. Although we maintain in a lot of the special initiatives, if you note in my testimony, uh, the older age group for disabled youth, for young people in uh, public housing, Blind. for, for Blind. vulnerable youth, uh, the young people who, because uh, what we, in the research uh, we did of the 3,000 young people between 21 to 24, half of them were in college. And so they could probably find another job. The other half were probably disconnected youth. Right. So I think we wanted to preserve options for older youth over 20, over 21 by making that option still available in the special initiatives section of the RFP. All right, so here's what I would say. Put me down on record as advocating on behalf of what you guys would view as the outliers and what I would view as the people who perhaps need the help the most. Incidentally, I was referring to my cousin Vinny, Joe Pesci, who, uh, <laughs> when he was arguing his case, he was saying youths, and the judge got annoyed at him and almost threw him out of court. So that was what I was referring to for those of you pop culture experts out there, a fine film, and I would recommend it in case you haven't seen it. The point that I'm making is this. I'm referring to the outliers on, on both ends. I believe that a robust summer youth employment program should not simply be tweaked and fine-tuned to the point where we're looking at it and saying, oh, are we hitting the absolute perfect targets and the right age demographics and the person is really interested in a job? I think that there are folks on both ends of the spectrum I think that we're accidentally cutting out. And I say this as a compliment. I think that your program has been working generally well, and I, you should certainly accept the compliment. They're few and far between from the council, as you know, for commissioners. <laughs> and I think, as you know, generally I believe that you do good work, and I appreciate the work of DYCD, some of the hardest working and committed people that I've met in the city of New York. And so what I'm saying is this. Let's talk about those two extremes, and I'm just making a case for both of those extremes. There are 14 and 15 year olds who have no interest in showing up at those fancy jobs that you discussed. I know this for a fact. 
Many of them are related to me, to be blunt. And so I'm certain that, you know, I always say that there's 11 people who watch this stuff at home late at night because I get, like, texts and tweets, and people say, yes, I'm one of those 11 people. Those 11 people who are watching this now at 1 o'clock in the morning, the rerun, because they can't fall asleep, I'm sure they know 14, 15-year-olds as well who are just looking for a job. And I'm sure they know parents who are just desperate to get their kids off the street and get them into a job, any job, where they get some life experience. And quite frankly, it's more important they have something on their resume, in my view, than they know how to write a resume or a cover letter. That, in my view, is actually the more important value. And so I'm making the case on their behalf. I'm asking you not to penalize them and to reconsider that on that one end of the spectrum. Then, unfortunately, the unfortunate reality, and I hate to say this, my friend, but I see this all the time for job applicants. A lot of the youth have no experience. They come out of college. They don't have a single job. It's not so easy to find jobs. And one of the things that you do, to your credit, is you give a financial incentive to hire those youths to, I'm sorry, I haven't used that term in years, I'm really enjoying myself over here, to hire those <laughs> youths and to give those 21 to 24-year-olds who, yeah, okay, they should have gotten a job, and they were wrong, and they should have hustled a little bit harder, but they didn't, and here they are now, and some of them may, in fact, be in college, and they can't get a job. You know why I can't get the job? Because your buddy, the 14-year-old in the sweater vest, he <laughs> got the job at 14, and now, by now, he's got the super-duper internship, and this 22-year-old schlub can't compete with him, and so he needs a job, and this is the job that he got, the summer youth employment job that he was getting, because you offered it for some of these kids. I know they're not kids anymore because they're 21 to 24, but it's giving them a lifeline as well. So I perhaps am taking a slightly contrarian view, and I'm advocating on behalf of those two extremes. The 14 to 15-year-old who isn't necessarily interested in necessarily showing up with their little suitcase, you know what I'm talking about? He shows up with a suitcase at 14, and he's going to pop it open, and he's so excited to be there, versus the kid who's just like rolling his eyes, says, Mom, I can't believe you're making me go to the office. And yes, he's showing up, and he's making coffee, and he's doing clerical work, but we're giving him the skills, which is a job, which that in its own is a skill. And then on the other extreme, the kid who didn't have that chance to do that, now he's 21 or 22 and he needs a job, and we're now giving him an incentive and a way to get a job where he wouldn't have gotten so he could get some experience. So when he applies a job from my office, I don't look at his resume and say, son, what have you done the last 22 years of your life? So put me down on the record as a council member who represents perhaps more youth than any other council member in New York City, but certainly among the top five in New York City, that I believe that you should tweak this concept to include more of those 14 to 15 year olds and more of the 21 to 24 year olds. And I appreciate the opportunity for the feedback and I appreciate the great work that you do and I'm certainly a big fan of the Summer Youth Employment Program. I know that you work hard to try to do as much as you can with the resources that quite frankly we allocate you. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Greenfield. Thank you. Uh, before I call Councilmember Chin, uh, I want to thank uh, Councilmember uh, Greenfield for, raise, for speaking on behalf of the young people, but also for raising the concern of the service providers. Because those service providers, they are day in and day out, they are there serving the young people. They know the concern, they witness exactly what uh, the young people are facing. And we know that uh, uh, young people, after spending a year in school, they want a break. As David said, they want a job. And I think that the service providers express that several times. The concept paper has certain, uh, you know, pattern that will affect probably negatively the summer youth program. You know, attendance, you know, dropout, and other will create also other challenges for the service providers. And I do believe when we work together, it is very important that uh, we take in consideration the concern of our partners. What I want to know what DYCD will do to address or to consider and to put in consideration the concern of the service providers regarding the new concept papers. So uh, that's what the concept paper process is for. We're getting feedback. We're doing focus groups. But as I said, I can't speak to what the final decision will be made because that will be in the RFP. But again, the task force, which I know you were a member of, one of the issues that was clearly discussed 
uh, quite thoroughly was the importance of focusing on the 16 to 21 year old age group, which was the overwhelming majority of young people who apply and get jobs in SYP. How do we better serve them? How do we better serve 14 to 15 year olds? How do we better serve 21 to 24 year olds? knowing that half of them are in college. So we wanted to maximize the resources to serve the largest number of young people. So we'll take your feedback uh, at this point, uh, you know, the, the, uh, and we'll you know, see where we go with that. Uh, thank you very much, Commissioner. We are mentioned by Council Member Vanessa Gibson and also Council Member Darlene Mealy. Let us call now uh, Council Member Chin for some questions. Thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, Commissioner, I just, early when you asked, sir, answer uh, Council Member Greenfield's question, so I just want to confirm again, it was 69,000? 69, um, 69,000 and change. Okay, so you almost met the target of 70,000, right? Right, right. That's great. Right, no. I and, mean, that's terrific that we're able to do that and DYC is and able to and do it's, that. And it's baseline funding. Yes. And we are going to be pushing for more. <laughs> we welcome it. Yes. So since you're able to accomplish that this summer, so I think we're very confident that you will be able to kind of develop more and be able to accept more, more of our youth this coming summer. Um, now, what is uh, DYCD's uh, procedure to inspect the work sites uh, for the SYEP participant? So it's a um, two-level approach. Uh, the providers are responsible for developing the worksite partnership with the employers. Um, the process is typically very simple. They could either apply online, where we have an online application where the employer goes to apply. Then the provider is responsible for actually having an in-person meeting with the employer to make sure that they understand the goals of the program, to make sure that they could be a good mentor to the young person that summer, and also to ensure the safety of the young person. Um, once that process is done, they submit the application to DYCD, and folks on our team will then review the application for approval. From DYCD's perspective, we also have staff that goes out to visit all the work sites as well, right, to make sure um, that it's in compliance with all the labor laws and all the regulations that our oversight expect us to implement year after year. Um, and we also do um, unannounced visits to the work sites as well. So, so you do initial visit to all the work sites? The provider is responsible for visiting a pre, it's a pre-assessment process, so before the kids are placed at the work sites in the spring, they have to visit every work site, and throughout the summer, they have to visit the work sites every week, yes. And we so hire additional staff in the summer, uh, what's called seasonals, and they supplement the existing workforce of DYCD, so we can visit every work site during the summer. Right. So you have about what, almost about 11,000 work sites? 12,000. 12,000? 12, 12, yeah. Wow, so you have enough uh, staff. That yes, can actually we do. Yes, do that. Okay. Um, to go back to the uh, the question of the 14, 15 year old, I, I remember there was um, a lot of discussion um, in the task force and then in, in the advisory committee. And so, there are some providers that are successful in developing jobs for this age group, right? Will they still have that flexibility, or just or, or the idea is just going to be straight? Um, training and uh, orientation right. for this age group? It will be project-based, right? So they, the young people won't be placed with an employer. The provider will be responsible for developing projects, um, and we're going to ensure at DYCD that we provide the adequate resources that they might need to do that. So in, in, that, in that case, for, for this age group, they're not going to be... Um, assigned to an employer, Correct. they're going to be assigned to a specific project. Correct. So, and the amount of, um, I mean, the amount of pay that they're getting is half, right, of what's um, the average, some of these job employment. So how is DYCD going to publicize that so kids know going in that this is, if they're not age group, this is what's being offered to them and not a, uh, a job where they're going to be uh, able to get more. So we're working on a communication plan, right? Um, we understand that young people 
um, currently expect to see a wage, right, when they work for SYP, but we're going to make sure that our providers as well understand that we're shifting from a wage model to a stipend model for younger youth. We're going to make sure on our website we include that in the FAQs. Um, we're also, when we send emails out to participants once they apply to the program, we're going to make sure there's a language in that email that explains to them the payment process before they accept the job within the program. And also at DYCD, obviously, actively using social media as a way to get the word out about the change. So are there going to be some flexibility, let's say, for a 15-year-old who was in a program this year? And... And they really want to have right, a so job. This is the, as the commissioner said, you know, this is a concept paper, right? And, and I think it's important to solicit feedback. So we're, we're listening to everyone who has been um, giving us their suggestions around how to move forward. Um, and we'll take everything back and, you know, we'll see what happens when the RFP comes out. And also in, in the, the concept paper also talks about um, like the ladder for, for leader leaders. program where you're asking them to do a 30 hours of orientation that's and they only allow to work 25 hours a week so, so it's all more than a week of uh, orientation and training right so i'm not sure if you're familiar with the ladders for leaders program it's it's our um, very successful internship program where the young people are expected to interview with employers so we want to make sure that they're prepared to be interviewed, right? So the 30, it's up to 30 hours. So depending on the providers responsible for doing an assessment once that young person comes in to be a part of the program. And if you have pr prior work experience, if you have a resume, a cover letter that has been developed, if you have gone through interviewing before, you might not necessarily need 30 hours. But if you're new, to the, the interviewing world and to the working at all, we want to make sure that we give you all the tools necessary. So when you go on the interview with the employer, whether it's at JP Morgan or Bank of America, you are successful. So that's, that's the rationale beyond the 30 hours. Some context, the Ladders for Leaders program has been around a decade, so this is not a new requirement. Right. The 30 hours, in fact, going back to when the Ladders for Leaders program was a pilot program that DYCD staff ran, where it was about a couple of hundred young people, uh, I personally would do a lot of the in, uh, mock interviews and, and, and the orientation, the 30 hours of orientation was done back then. So this is not a new requirement. This is just restating right. what's already in place. Mm -hmm. well, so what is the, the cost uh, for a participant? Let's go back to the 14, 15 year old. Um, are there, what's the difference in terms of the cost for the participant? Are you referring to the wages? Um, yeah, and also uh, I guess what the agency, what you will be reimbursing the agency. So we're still in the process of having conversations with OMB as we think about what the price per participant is going to be across the entire SYP programs that we're offering. Um, currently, providers are paid three twenty-five per per, per um, participant, um, and you know, again, as I said, we're looking at the current model, the, the cost implications, based on what we're asking providers to do. We're in conversations with OMB, but right now, there's there's no new cost that I could talk about because we're still developing that as we speak. Okay, I, I mean, in uh, your consumer chain, if you allow me, let me jump in just uh, one second with respect to the cost. I know that, you know, according to the concept, the new concept paper, uh, you are looking for uh, expo career exploration based on project uh, based learning opportunities. That will require also more uh, skill, you know, employees or staff, people with more qualifications. So will that uh, have a, 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 an impact on the cost? And if yes, are you going to adjust the cost? I don't know if it's... Well, so... Because more, more qualified model, staff, that means more money. you got to spend more money. So each and model has a different cost. Uh, we're getting feedback through uh, focus groups, through the concept paper process, and we're sitting down with OMB, and hopefully we'll settle all these before we can issue the RFP, because you can't issue a request for proposal unless the nonprofit agency knows how much we're reimbursing people for each of the nine models? Nine models. So it's a work in progress. Uh, you know, the current rate is 325. We know that, you know, that may change. But again, we can't give you any specifics until we get a, more clarity from the budget office. Let me put it another way. Do you think that is going to cost DYCD more money? We haven't reached that decision yet. No, but listen, uh, this is very simple. If you hire more qualified staff, you would have to pay them more money, yes or no? 
we know that the cost will vary, and so we ha we're not ready to say how much it will cost. Because no, no, we, I'm not talking about how much. But at least if you have more qualified staff, it's, you know, it's very clear, very simple that you're going to spend more money to hire them. And at this point, I can't give you any more detail than that because uh, the, the discussions with OMB are ongoing. So for me to say anything at this point would, would uh, you know, wouldn't be uh, an honest answer. At this point, the current rate is 325, and some programs pay up to 1,000. Some programs pay uh, 600. So the current rate is in, is in the concept paper from 325 to 1,000. What that new range will be is to be determined. Yeah, but what I'm trying to figure out, do you have a plan to cover the new cost or additional cost? That, that is part what of is the ongoing the conversations with ONB. So obviously we're getting feedback through the concept paper of what people think it should cost. We're looking at that data. We're sharing with OMB. So the plan is to sit down with OMB and come to a final decision before the RFP is released. Uh, thank you very much. Councilmember Chin, please. Well, I guess relating to the RFP, when are you, because the concept paper from your testimony is due back this week. Right. So, right. so well, how, how soon? We don't have a fixed date for release yet because we want to make sure we get all the comments in. And obviously, we want to settle the issue of, of cost reimbursement because you can't do a request for a proposal without money. So once we have clarity on that issue, we'll, we'll be moving forward. I mean, I said this earlier to someone that um, you know, this is a historic moment. And I don't use the word historic, but I think because I've worked for four mayors, I can get to use the word historic, that in the 16 years that the city has funded this program, we've never had baseline funding. I mean, when you and I were in the service employment program many, many years ago, it was federally funded. And in 2000, the federal government walked away from this program, and, fund, and, the, and the funding for it fell on the city primarily and to a lesser extent the state. So we've been on this roller coaster, the budget dance, for the last 16 years, where two weeks before the start of summer is when we know what our budget is. So we want to do it right not necessarily fast, because this is probably the biggest change to SYP since the inception of the program uh, more than 60 years ago. So, uh, but there's still got to be some consistency, because you're not expecting, I mean, I assume you expect a lot of the providers oh, yeah. pretty much would be the same. Well, you right? missed the earlier testimony that uh, we want to grow the portfolio, because when the last RFP was issued in 2011, was it 2011? 2013. 2013. Oh. Is that, uh, 2011. 2011. Uh, the baseline funding in that RFP, 23,000 jobs. So we're at 70. And it's, we've asked an awful lot of not only the staff at DYC, but also the same number of groups to, to more than triple the number of jobs. So we expect to not only uh, reach out to the current universe of providers, but bring in new providers. So one of the things we've been actively doing is that we know, for example, there's going to be funding set aside for programs in the 15 uh, public housing developments that are high crime. We want to ask the cornerstone programs who work with young people in public housing to consider maybe running an SYP program if they, if they work in that area. We work, as you know, with the runaway and homeless youth uh, programs, and it makes no sense for them not to consider this because if you're providing residential services to young people, you should be thinking about a wraparound program for a, a guaranteed summer So job. are you starting those conversations yes, with we, them now? Well, we started a month and a half ago okay. when, the, when the concept paper was released because this is our opportunity to engage people who have not been in the process to consider it. Uh, it ultimately comes down to what the reimbursement rate will be because any program will decide, well, this makes sense programmatically, but it doesn't make sense budgetarily. So, But relating to that, too, is then this is the baseline funding for 70,000 some right. new job, and it might be less than that because of the costs going up. So in some ways, we still have to continue to advocate for more resources, because now you've got all these special category that we're expanding to. So in my mind, it's like, okay, the, the, the funding that we got baseline is not sufficient. And we uh, and the council, we're going to have to advocate, continue to advocate for more because we want to make sure that more youth will be able to take advantage of the summer youth 
It's okay. too soon to draw that conclusion, but you know, if the council wants to give us more money, we welcome it. Well, it's not too soon. You know, we're asking for universal some of these jobs. So on our side, we're going to continue uh, to advocate. Thank you, Chair. You're very welcome, Councilmember Chin. Councilmember Gilson, please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioner and your team. It's great to see you. Um, I represent the Bronx, uh, just in case you weren't aware. Oh. <laughs> um, and truly, I appreciate, you know, DYCD and the entire efforts, especially this city council. I was speaker. I was proud to join with Councilmember Chin in being a part of the youth task force here in the council. So we had lots and lots of meetings to talk about summer youth employment and how we can continue to increase the capacity for DYCD, look at some of the challenges that we face with young adults between 14 and 24, and I appreciate looking through your testimony at some of the targeted populations that we aim to serve in this new RFP. Every category you describe, every targeted population I represent, students with disabilities, students that are facing the trauma around gun violence in their communities, I have it all, right? Um, the neighborhood map program, I represent one of them, which is Butler Houses, and we do have a cornerstone program there. So I appreciate the efforts to reach out to those cornerstones because they are today providing services and resources for many of the young people. So what I wanted to just quickly ask about, um, and I think you know, the last time we issued an RFP was 2011. So this is for us a real opportunity to expand on our relationships and partnerships and really look across the spectrum at many providers that are serving young people today. Um, I think what I find challenging sometimes in the Bronx is that many of my smaller minority-based providers don't always get a lot of attention. And so they have to compete with the larger organizations that may or, not, may, or may not be serving my particular community. Um, I am a little concerned, and the chair spoke a little bit about it, and I guess I'll just answer what I think the question is. Um, in the concept paper, the suggestion of new programs requiring more experienced staff that have career-specific knowledge and talents is really going to cause providers to after either look at hiring more staff that's more experienced, meaning they have to pay them more, or it's going to say to a lot of our senior level older staff that, you know, your skills are great, but we now need to look at 21st century teaching, so to speak. So yes, it's going to cost more um, because it's going to be a burden on a lot of the providers to have to pay more. And so while we have to have this conversation today, I think it's really important to look at the reality of what we face. And if we're talking about hiring more people that have targeted experience in an area serving youth, minority youth, youth that are facing gun violence and, and violence in general, then we definitely need to look at paying them more. So I'm, I'm, I think that's important to recognize. Um, I wanted to ask a question because in the concept paper, I did not see a lot of discussion on the city council's uh, work, learn, grow. So I'm still used, not used to that name. I call it all year round youth employment program. That's what it is to me. Um, and you understand the importance of focusing on youth employment all year round. And for many of our constituents, this is the only opportunity they get to work, to earn a salary, to build responsibility, to build job skills. So I'm wondering in the concept paper, are you looking in the RFP at providers that can also serve uh, youth employment all year round as well? So the Work, Learn, and Grow program, as you know, is a council-funded initiative yes. which is separate from SYP, and the link is that because uh, the money comes in you know, on an annual basis, we have to figure out how to um, uh, get young people recruited and employed. So we've built it in as sort of like a... Um, complement to SYP. Uh, no decision has been made to add it into the program. No decision has been made to not include it either. But at this point, uh, since it's a council-funded initiative, uh, additional funding would probably be needed to make it happen. So I will take it back, the concerns that you've raised. Um, um, well, our, our, the, the charge of the task force 
was really to, I mean, of the uh, concept paper is really to focus on the summer youth employment program. Certainly, uh, it's been a great success. We appreciate the council's support for this program. Um, and, but again, there is no uh, uh, funding tied to it to make it part of the concept paper because it's sort of an appendage to SYP, not, a, not one of the baseline functions. Okay, so I ask that you consider that. Um, as someone who talks lovingly about the all-year-round youth employment program, my constituents love it because they understand that while we focus on young people during the summer when they're not in school, when they are in school, we also have to continue to keep a priority. So um, I know the funding stream is different, but that should not preclude us from looking at including it and making sure that it's a part of the larger conversation. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about is in our task force, we had recommended aligning the program development, procurement, and evaluation, which is a very key part of SYEP, to ensure that many of our young people are provided with a set of work skills that will prepare them for future employment. Um, so other than the summer pilots, which you've already established with a number of key providers like LaGuardia and others, have there been any other program changes that you've initiated to date that you could talk about yet that looks at program development, procurement, and evaluation? Yeah, so on the, on the evaluation side, we actually worked with MDRC to look at the pilots that we implemented this summer. Okay. Um, as you can imagine, it would take some time for them to really look at the data, so hopefully by the end of October to early November, we should have a full report um, out from MDRC, and based on those findings, we'll definitely take a look at them to see how that might impact the RFP um, as well. In terms of procurement, um, I think what we've been doing is working for the most part in terms of ensuring that folks understand the procurement process, right, mm -hmm. um, within our portfolio. Um, we've also encouraged new groups that might be looking towards coming into SYP to have connections with folks at HHX, is it, yeah, HHS Accelerator, so they become pre-qualified in case they want to become a SYP provider. So we've been actively sharing that with groups that have interest in working with this program as well. So those are the kind of two pieces that we have, we've been working on. And if, if you know of groups interested in uh, pre-qualifying, let us know and uh, we'll have our staff do a workshop for them on how to pre-qualify an, an HH Accelerator because uh, the way the system's procurement process works now is that you have to demonstrate uh, experience in a specific service area, and that's how we grow the, uh, the universe of people who get funding is we, we expand the, the number of people who pre-qualify. Okay. Um, the other question I had, just two final questions, um, is expanding on our current relationships with the providers that we have today that have existing contracts with DYCD, but also looking at furthering opportunities. So as an example, there are many young people that we need to get into the STEM field, right? Science, technology, engineering, architecture, and math. Um, the tech industry that continues to evolve, the movie industry. Um, have you considered looking at some of the existing organizations that provide uh, services in this industry as a way to bring them on? So I think of, in my district, uh, my business improvement districts, right, and merchants associations for those young people that could have an interest in the small business sector and they could move towards that track. Has that been a discussion? In fact, we've actually been doing this. So a couple of years ago, I was the first commissioner to ever speak before the uh, uh, Business Improvement District Association and made a pitch for them because I recognized that we want all kinds of employers. We want big mm -hmm. companies like right. Models, but we want small businesses as well to be work sites. So w the Business Improvement Districts and the Chamber of Commerces are definitely people that we've worked with over the last several years to uh, develop job and work sites. As far as the, the STEM types of jobs, we've been working with, closely with the Center for Youth Employment to, uh, to begin to tap into employers who provide those types of jobs. A number of young people work with film companies as well as with uh, in, uh, media, oh, wow. in the media companies. We've had young people work at AOL. Mm -hmm. um, a, a few years ago, we had somebody work at uh, that radio uh, internet. Um, 
Yeah, it's not Spotify. What's other? But, yeah. Pandora. Pandora. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think that's definitely on our radar. Obviously, th- we have to do more aggressive matching there. Not every young person is ready to work in Pandora or AOL. So we, we try to do that. And the final piece of which I think will make a big uh, leap forward for us is the school-based uh, proposal. Uh, we hope to engage the career and technical education schools uh, because they – they have uh, relationships with employers, but they don't have the way to pay young people on a summer apprenticeship. Uh, so my hope is that um, once we release the RFP, we'll have uh, proposals from nonprofits who are working with the career and technical education schools so we can build on school year learning so what they learn during the school year can be amplified and built on in a summer apprenticeship program in that field. Okay, that's great. Uh, these ideas all sound great. I just can't wait till we um, put them on paper and implement them. Um, every year we've gotten better in terms of increasing capacity for SYEP. We're at a record-breaking 70,000. Um, on average, there are about 135,000 that apply, and the city continues to grow. Um, and so obviously we want to do more and more and more as best we can. And you have a council that is committed to doing that. We just want to make sure that we are doing as much outreach as we can. Um, in the specialized, uh, the special initiatives under the, the RFP that will come out is the topic of vulnerable youth, right? So we always talk about homeless, runaway youth, justice-involved youth, aging out of foster care, um, and those that are receiving some ACS services. What I also ask that should be included, because we have a homelessness crisis, we have a lot of children living in temporary housing. They may not be homeless or runaway youth, but they're simply living in a shelter. Um, They are vulnerable. And DOE has been working extremely hard with ACS and other agencies. Um, I represent a large concentration of them in my school district, District 9. Um, And so those that are middle school age and moving out into high school, I I definitely want to make sure that that is on your radar as a population that truly needs to be serviced as well. So, in fact, we've been working with them. So you're absolutely right that you have uh, work eligible young people living in family shelters. Yes, and so a lot. Uh, the last this past summer we worked with Women in Need, uh, one of the largest family shelter providers in the city, um, and they uh, helped us recruit young people from all the family shelters that they work with to, to apply for some of these employment jobs. And it was a great success. And so I'm hoping to reach out to other family shelters directly because, again, my experience is that it's always better to work with people who know the young people directly. So just like uh, when we worked with the Broom Street Academy a couple of years ago, and they referred uh, a couple of hundred of their young people, because half the population of that school is homeless, they were able to identify the young person who is ready to work and then work with our SYP programs to place them in a summer job. The same holds true for the Women in Need and Project Renewal and all the other uh, nonprofits that run family shelters, because because it's a tragedy that young uh, that a family today spends on average 400 days in a family shelter, so it's important that we provide them access to the same level of services that people who don't live in family shelters have. So we're we're starting that process. We hope to engage more family shelters because we think uh, they can be a, a great partner in in either running the summer youth employment program. I'm trying to get more people to apply for the funding because mm-hmm. we need more providers. And it's, if you're working with this population, it's even better that you get the funding to run the program. Okay, I agree. And I encourage you, DOE has a list of all the school districts that have the highest concentration. District 9 in the Bronx, District 23 in Brooklyn are the top two. Um, I love the work Project Renewal does and WIN, um, but there are a lot more out there that you definitely need to reach out to as soon as possible um, because they are serving our children today. So thank you very much. Uh, Looking forward to our future conversations and everything you can do to ensure that this RFP is reflective of our commitment, um, all of the priorities we focused on. I don't want to lose sight of the smaller-based 
CBOs that serve our children today, but I also want to open up for new opportunity as well. So we can do both simultaneously. Uh, we don't want to forget about the minority-based organizations that serve our children, but I also want to open up opportunities for more uh, business sectors that I know many of our young people would take advantage of. So thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Councilman Member Gibson. Uh, Commissioner, uh, the concept paper indicated that DYCD hopes to serve as many as 220,000 students through the new school-based program. Could you give us some detail about the structure, how this is going to set up? So we intend to serve um, up to 20,000 over the next few years, right? That's not the number that we're starting with. I think it's important. We're going to start with maybe three to 5,000 young people across um, some DOE schools that would be identified by DOE. Um, the idea there, obviously, with a new model, you want to learn from your experiences. You don't want to scale up too quickly, and you, want to, you also want to make sure when you're implementing, you're implementing at a pace where people will be successful. Um, so ideally, the CBO will be working directly with a school. The CBO will be responsible for providing job development for that school, as well as providing project-based opportunities for the younger youth. Also, talking to the principal to figure out what are the needs that you need in this school. Is, is your focus on financial literacy? Is your focus on work readiness? What is it that you want us to focus on? And collectively, the principal and the CBO will come up with a 15-hour curriculum that the CBO will offer in the spring um, before the young people are placed in the summer jobs or in the project that they're going to be working on during that summer. So it, typically, that's how it will work. So what can you tell us about the costs of the, this program? As the commissioner said before, we're still in talks with OMB as we kind of flesh out this idea. There's still a lot of moving parts, so there's no cost that has been decided on yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're talking about the uh, NYC, New York City schools. How will this program affect applicants who are not enrolled in New York City school, like many of them are, are who attend the uh, Catholic and parochial school? Oh, you mean non non What about if non they have schools. also if they have also some disconnected youth? How this will impact them? Because we are talking about New York City school, not Catholic school, not parochial school or other school. And in, within those schools also we may and we surely have some disconnected youth. Well, if, if they're in school, they're, they're technically not disconnected, right, because they're already in high schools, right? So there, was, there will be no impact to those young people. But if you're disconnected and you're not in a school, then you're able to apply to the community-based option or the special initiative option, so you still have an opportunity to work in the program. So the question is, and because they, they, don't, they don't attend the public school, the New York City school, Will that be accepted also? Will you do the outreach to make sure that the, those disconnected youth, they are served also by the program? Right, no, right now, um, there is no requirement to attend school. So of the 70,000 jobs, we... Um, we uh, I'm sorry? We fund, right now, there is no requirement to attend school. You have to be between the ages of 14 and 24. Nowhere in the application does it says you must be in a school. So. Um, any young person who's not in school can apply right now. When we move to a new model, a certain number of those jobs will be set aside for school-based partnerships. But that's only 20,000 out of 70,000. So a major vast majority of the 70,000 jobs will be open to anyone uh, who meets the age requirements, and there is no requirement to attend school. Oh, that's great. So that means it doesn't matter if the kid or the young uh, people that go to Catholic school, parochial school, no. public school, or don't go to school at all? As long as they meet the age requirements. Great. Very good. Uh, you, know, you know that uh, I say that several times. When you do something in life, you got to evaluate what you are doing. You got to sit down and figure out if what you are doing is successful or not. You may think that is successful, but we got to put in paper. We got to, you know, with science and uh, technology or resources that we have, we got to be able to say, you know what, this works or this doesn't work. Can you tell us about your evaluation method about for the uh, SYEP and also work, learning, grow? So, how you uh, evaluate the success of those programs? 
So let me start and then um, uh, uh, Andre can add in. So um, each individual program receives an evaluation and a rating every year. And so there's a very um, micro level evaluation of every program. There's a, there have been numerous evaluations of the Summer Youth Employment Program, Some, and we'll share with you um, them as well. The, the most uh, notable one is the one that was done by um, UPenn. Uh, yeah, University of, of Pennsylvania, or the Wharton Business School, uh, which looked at data over seven years? Seven years. Eleven years. Eleven years. Mm -hmm. and, so it, it, and they looked at uh, young people who applied for SYP and didn't get it, and young people who a applied and got the job. And that study is probably the most comprehensive evaluation of the summer youth employment program uh, in the country, because we're the largest. And the, th the key findings from that program were, one is that being in the summer youth employment uh, program reduced the death rate, reduced the death rate of young people 10 years later. Just one job. It also reduced the likelihood of being incarcerated. Just one job, because uh, as you know, not every young person who applies gets selected. So they were able to track using social security data outcomes of young people over a decade. So that we will share the Warren study. There have been some smaller studies and evaluations of SYP, including by NYU and um, anyone else? MDRC. M MDRC, which we'll gladly share with you. There is a lot of rich information. In fact, I did a recent visit with um, uh, the, uh, the chair of the House uh, Minority the minority member of the House Labor Committee uh, of, a, of our Summary's Employment Program up in Washington Heights, and he was looking for evaluations because you know the federal government, you know, if there's changes in Washington, may want to come back and look at investing in the Summary's Employment Program. So we have a lot of evaluations we'd be happy to share with you. Thank you very much. You know, for the sake of time, because we are running out, out of time, let me ask you one last question. Sure. I believe this is the one last one. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, we know that our service providers, uh, you know that, I know that, and all of us, we know that. They are wonderful, great people who have been doing everything that they can do to help the young people to collaborate with the city council, with DYCD. But what do you do to ensure that they have the skill, the resources, and everything that they need to fulfill their job and to do the best that they can do, especially when we look at the concept paper, there are some you know, challenges that they will face because of the requirement of the new concept paper. What do you will put in place to help them? So we're very committed to capacity building and professional development. It's been a big part of DYCD's services because we understand that the nonprofits are also customers. And so um, my very first job at DYCD back in 2003 was Assistant Commissioner for Capacity Building. So we have dedicated uh, technical assistance providers who help uh, all our workforce programs. In fact, early on, a few years ago, when we set the ambitious goal of increasing the number of uh, public, uh, private sector work sites, we recognized that some people needed help in how do you engage employers. And so uh, we... Uh, WPTI. You know, WT... Oh. What to explain? Yeah. <laughs> so we worked with um, WPTI, which is the Workforce Professional Training Institute, to come in to really talk to providers around how do you manage and develop relationship with private employers, right? It was a very, it was a culture shift for our providers. Most of them are used to developing jobs within their local communities, which is small and mom pop businesses. But there's actually a very different sort of like technique, right, in terms of how you develop jobs with private employers, how you engage them throughout the process, and how you follow up with them, right? So WPTI came in, created this really comprehensive and robust training for providers, um, and uh, we have seen, obviously, the success of the training with our numbers moving from 28% of private sector jobs to 45% this year. And that's something that we intend to do, continue to do with WPTI, whichever other groups we have here in the city to provide whatever TA that the providers might need. I commend you, I commend DYCD and the commissioner and your staff for all the effort that you are doing to strengthen the relationship with the service providers. But uh, what I'm talking about, I had a meeting with certain service providers who expressed their concern 
about the challenges that uh, the new concept paper will create in terms of, number one, the ability to fulfill what, whatever the concept paper required, and also the concern about discouragement and, uh, and the young people who are going to, to uh, uh, benefit from the, the program. They are very concerned about you know, the, the outcome or the impact of the certain portion of the new concept paper. My uh, recommendation and advice is to meet with them and to sit down with them and ask them, you, you know, what are their concerns, what, what are their suggestions, and to work together to make sure that the new concept paper doesn't create a decrease in the number of participants because our young people, we have, to, we, we have to increase the number, not decrease the number. And I commend you again. This is a historic. We get close to 70,000, but we got to make sure that we do everything possible to conserve, to protect, and preserve the number we reach to, but also to increase it. Thank you. I mean, we welcome feedback uh, where we get it. We actively reach out to the service providers. We have focus groups, and that's part of the reason why we extended the deadline, because we wanted to give every opportunity for your, uh, people who provide the service to comment on it. But thank you again for your support. Um, you know, this was one of the things on my wish list is to to baseline the funding for the Summer Youth Employment Program when I started as commissioner four years ago, and I'm happy to check it off my wish list. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Thank you very much on to all your staff. Thank, thank you. you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, let us call the, the first panel. Brian Likata, United uh, Activities uh, Unlimited. Sandina Sanchez, from Children's Aid. Elizabeth Clay Roy, I believe, from Phil's Neighborhoods. And also Grant uh, Coles from Citizen Committee for Children. First of all, let me. Make it four minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Let me first uh, thank you uh, for coming, for being part of this uh, very important uh, public hearing. And I want to thank you also for everything that you are doing every single day for our young people. Thank you very much. But because of the time constraint, you know, we have uh, to limit it, you know, each speaker. We have, to, we have to give you four minutes. All right. You may start any time. Please first state your name for the record. I got a present. Hello. Uh, Sandino Sanchez, the Children's Aid Society. My name is Sandino Sanchez, and I am the Teen Workforce Development Director for the Children's Aid Society. Thank you, Chair. Eugene and the members of the Youth Service Committee for the opportunity to submit testimony about the importance of Summer Youth Employment Program in New York. At Children's Aid, we, have, we believe that all children have limitless potential, but for those growing up surrounded by poverty, family instability, and physical and emotional stress, life is too often about survival, not possibility. It is unacceptable that in New York, a city of historic opportunities, so many of our children face serious barriers to realize their own promise. Children's Aid helps kids build a solid foundation for their future by supporting their academic success at every level through college. We do through a comprehensive counterattack on the obstacles that threaten achievement in school. The Summer Youth Employment Program. Mm -hmm. Children's, Aid, Children's Aid Youth Development Programs build upon a foundation that supports young people becoming independent. We offer programs that provide a graduated series of experiences that help young adults 
cultivate their unique interests and talents, obtain leadership skills, build resiliency and self-confidence, all skills required to succeed in adulthood. The Summer Youth Employment Program is a core part of the employment and work readiness program that the Children's Aid Society provides to young adults in New York City. For the past seven years, Children's Aid has had contracts with the Department of Youth and Community Development for SYP slots. In 2017, Children's Aid received 7,800 applications for 20, 2,678 SYP slots. Of the total cohort, 60% of the young people were between the ages of 16 to 24, 40% were 14 and 15 years old, 55% were male, 45 female, 90% of the students enrolled resided in the Bronx and Manhattan. There is an immense demand for this program, which for many of our youth provides supplemental income for their families or support a young person's ability to pay for higher education. The school-based option. While the new school-based option provides promising partnerships for the school community, there are some concerns with the current guidelines for this model. For example, this model does not seem to take into account already existing partnerships, also community-based organizations, school relationships, et cetera, has shown that the most successful partnerships are those that were in this organic relationship between the CBO and the school administration. According, accordingly, CBOs who already have successful partnership with schools should be allowed to apply even if the school in question is, are not on the DYCD provided list of eligible schools. Some of the other recommendations we have for the school-based model are as follows. It is not clear if this option will include older youth as well. Our recommendation is that the age range for this option should be 14 to 21. The year-round services for this option is not clear. 20 hours of work readiness or instruction for Jan from January to June is not enough. Our recommendation is that the requirement should include at least five to, five to 10 hours per week for that same six months period. Are there, are there wages or stipends for this options? Question. Similar to work, learning, role, the teens enrolled should receive some form of compensation. All the teens should also be placed in a work site work sites to obtain needed experience. Classroom instruction is not enough. Not clear how schools will qualify for how, or how they will be picked or matched up with a provider. A successful school community partnership have shared goals and objectives. The use of shared space and a fully functional staff presence are essential elements for the success and they are not outlined in the RFP. This option will require certified teachers, social workers, career coaches to be successful and the price per participant should be at close of 2,000 each. The provider should know what schools Thank are you. available. Can you conclude, please? I'm sorry about it. Yes. Let's go uh, to the next one. Uh, that, okay, that's finish, fine. finish the sentence. Sure. Uh, the, the concept paper f has both the 14 and 15 year olds in different development stages, which is a grave error. Instead of all teens that are participating for the first time and have no experience, should receive the intentional training and all others with experience all right. should be placed. Thank, Thank you very much, sir. The rest we've provided. Yes, I will. Yes. The next uh, speaker. First, I'd like to thank Chair Eugene uh, and the City Council for the opportunity to testify here today. Uh, Chair Eugene, I'd like to begin by reiterating what you had said earlier. The uh, Summer Youth Employment Program is the first summer job that many of the youth in New York City have. Mm -hmm. And it's our responsibility to assure that they have every opportunity so that the future of New York City these children do not deserve anything less. With that being said, looking at the new concept paper, there are many questions that still remain. Um, in order to address some of these issues, we need more information. Uh, the PPP for all of the different models. I cannot suggest what a PPP would be when I, do not what, uh, I don't know what is required of me. Uh, in order to provide the services for these different models, the providers need to know in detail so that we can actually say, yes, we can do this, or we can respond and say, this is what we need in order to do this. Um, we have a mutual goal here to serve all of New York City's youth. Over the last 10 plus years, I have had the privilege of working with the Summer Youth Employment Program. Uh, I have seen the program grow through two different administrations. I have seen City Council invest money into this program. Um, I agree with you. It's not about quantity. It's about quality. If we're looking to get quality out of this program, um, we need better buy-in from the providers. Uh, the people on the ground can always tell you what is being done 
and what needs to be done. Right now, one of the biggest questions that we have is, unfortunately, funding. Um, without the proper funding, we can't hire the correct staff to make sure that we're doing everything for the children's abilities. Um, disconnected youth is one of our biggest barriers. The funding that is coming in for the Summer Youth Employment Program is 30 times less in the SYEP program than it is in other sister programs. I'll say that again, it's 30 times less. $325 is not enough money over the summer to fix any problem, let alone a problem that a youth with a disability or any other vulnerable youth is facing. In order to hire counselors, provide wraparound services, the amount of money that we need is in the thousands for each of these children. Unfortunately, this is a fact. This is not just an opinion. Uh, the Summer Youth Program does provide a lot of quality. What it doesn't provide in this concept paper is room for us to know our children and provide the services that they need. Saying that all 14 and 15 year olds cannot work because it's in the concept paper, there are many 14 and 15 year olds that are ready to work and should be allowed to work. There are some 14 and 15 year olds that need a little bit more guidance. And for that matter, there are some 18-year-olds that need more guidance and shouldn't be working. It should be up to the provider's discretion to decide which of the youth are ready to work and which of the youth need more experience. Um, but in order for that to happen, we need more information on these different models. I'll say that again. In order for us to be able to provide you the feedback that you need, we need more information. What is being asked of us? How many hours? Um, how many children are we asked to serve in each of these different modules? What are the outcomes that we are going to be judged on? Personally, I would like to know this in advance. I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Thank you so much to committee chair and members and, and staff. My name is Elizabeth Clay Roy, Chief of Staff at Phipps Neighborhoods. Our organization helps children, youth, and families in South Bronx neighborhoods rise above poverty through education, career programs, and access to community resources. We serve approximately 11,000 participants each year, including over 550 summer youth employment program participants. Phipps Neighborhoods is very supportive of the city broadening the reach and deepening the effect of the SYEP. As noted in our written response to DYCD's uh, concept paper, we believe extending the program, making it more comprehensive, linking to growing sectors, integrating with high schools, and supporting vulnerable populations are all valuable steps forward. In fact, as a leader in the South Bronx Rising Together Collective Impact Partnership, we executed a successful pilot program for disconnected youth called Summer Youth Career Launch uh, in collaboration with Bronx Works and Children's Aid um, in 2016 that increased training time, allowed youth to select their own career pathways, increased stipends modestly, and had post-placement career readiness support. All of the youth who participated were unemployed and out of school at the start of the summer. And three months after completion of the summer youth career launch, 73% of participants are known to have had a positive outcome of work, college, or a supported job program. Looking at the program citywide as laid out in the concept paper and as is being executed today, our priority recommendations are as follows. Um, the city has wholeheartedly embraced a sector-based employment strategy. There are many positive aspects to this approach in terms of training and contextualized learning. However, many young people have not yet been exposed to enough career options to be positioned to make informed choices that in impact their future. SYP participants should be provided with career choices rather than being pigeonholed in specific pathways too soon. So Phipps Neighborhoods recommends allowing CBO providers the opportunity to offer a variety of sectors as a part of the training and placement options so that in, we increase the participants' ability to be exposed to different career pathways. Next, eligible youth should have access to supports that reduce barrier, barriers to participation. Child care should be provided to all SYEP participants who have children as it presents a significant barrier to many, particularly those in the vulnerable youth categories. Teens and youth with disabilities should be accommodated to find meaningful placement options and post-placement connections to existing city resources. 
Transportation. Young people have a three to four week gap between employment and their first paycheck, creating a challenge and additional stress on participants. The program should consider adopting the Department of Education's model of providing Metro cards to summer school students. Alternatively, CBO providers could be provided with an additional budget line item paid in advance to fund transportation for participants prior to receiving their first stipend. The current allocation of eight hours for training prior to the pro program falls significantly short of best practices in both career readiness programs and in youth development. Participants should be engaged in on time, um, ongoing learning and reflection throughout the course of the program to facilitate uh, real time learning. Um, and the focus on social emotional learning uh, is important, um, but also will require additional training hours for each group um, so that it can be attained. Current SYP funding requires that providers manage two separate budgets during the fiscal year, a three-month and a nine-month budget that is cumbersome and limiting to CBOs, and FIPS neighborhoods would recommend awarding a single budget per year and allowing the CBO partner to determine how to manage and allocate those funds. Traditional funding for SYP has not provided the skill level of staffing needed for a more comprehensive model. Sector-based training, social emotional learning, and project-based learning require a higher level of skills and expertise. Adequate increases in funding level would be required in order for CBOs to address the requirements as laid out within. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Good, good afternoon. My name is Grant Coles, and I'm the Senior Policy and Advocacy Associate for Citizens Committee for Children. Uh, CCC is a 74-year-old independent, multi-issue child advocacy organization dedicated to ensuring every New York child is healthy, housed, educated, and safe. I want to thank you, Chair Eugene, and the Youth Services Committee for holding today's hearing. Uh, CCC appreciates the City Council's long-standing commitment to SYEP, particularly your ongoing work to ensure as many youth as possible can participate each summer. It is not unnoticed that every summer, thousands more youth are able to participate in SYEP because of the funding and advocacy from the City Council. We also pretty appreciate the City Council working with the administration to create the New York City Youth Employment Task Force on which CCC participated. And notably, we thank the administration for its commitment to the work of the task force, for baselining 70,000 slots last year, and for their thoughtful new SYEP concept paper. CCC believes that the SYEP concept paper sets up New York City to have an even stronger summer youth employment program in the future. Um, some of the highlights we particularly support include the inclusion of a year-round sector-focused work program for youth, the designated SYEP programming slots for vulnerable youth and youth with disabilities, and the concepts paper emphasis on finding jobs for youth in promising career sectors. Um, but to further strengthen the RFP, CCC will be offering the administration recommendations in the form of comments next week. We hope that the City Council can also weigh in with similar recommendations. Our recommendations will include some of the following. First, the administration should fund DYCD to increase SYP capacity. Um, though, the, though the concept paper is open-ended, it only uh, anticipates 70,000 slots, we urge the administration at a minimum to build the SYP contracts around an expectation of growing to serve 100,000 youth each summer on the way to a universal program. Second. DYCD should provide free or reduced priced Metro cards to SYP participants, similar as my colleague just mentioned. Third, DYCD should inform, every, should inform providers of the number of slots they are being awarded as early as possible. Um, providers have had a yearly challenge of coordinating SYP job placements because they have not been informed of the actual number of youth they will serve until very late, sometimes with only a few weeks' notice. Fourth, DYCD should modify the new training and orientation process that is outlined in the concept paper. Uh, CCC is concerned that an eight-hour unpaid orientation session for older youth will be a deterrent to program participation. While an orientation is important to teaching the skills that are necessary to make SYP successful, an eight-hour orientation seems too long for youth to sufficiently engage and retain information. Also, we believe that returning SYP participants should be allowed to have a shorter orientation requirement as they have already gone through the orientation process and have experience with SYP. And we also hope that DYCD will encourage the use of a more interactive, relevant, and skill-based training during the orientation process. Uh, sixth uh, recommendation, increase funding for providers. As mentioned, $325 for any service option is too low um, to be effectively administer support in youth and SYP placements. And that's also, we want to note, the same price that's been in effect since 2004. And this is an opportune time to address this low rate. 
Uh, seventh, in, uh, we have suggestions to modify the younger youth model as described in the concept paper, um, which is included in our testimony. And we also have a, a number of suggestions for the vulnerable youth model, um, including uh, we, we do, are very supportive that there are slots reserved for these youth, but we, are, uh, we believe that they should not necessarily be, uh, that the task of managing their caseload should not, be provide, should not be put on the providers, but should be retained by their already in their systems. Um, in conclusion, CCC is grateful to the City Council for its commitment to youth employment and SYEP, and we look forward to working with you to support our youth through a continually improving SYEP program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the members of the panel. And uh, according to what you just said, it seemed that really you were not provided with uh, necessary information that you need, you know. And I'm going to meet with the members of the committee, and we will contact DYCD to ensure that they communicate with you, they sit down with you, and take uh, in consideration your concern. If you have additional suggestion or recommendation, you can still reach out my office, and we'll be more than happy to, uh, to forward to DYCD your recommendation and also ask them to sit down with you and to do everything that possible in order to prevent the new concept paper to hurt the wonderful job that you are doing for our young people. Thank you very much. Rebecca Griskin, I believe. And forgive me if I mispronounce your name. From, uh, is that Major of America? Great, I did it. Thank you very much. And uh, Rian Mondel from CPC, Chinese American. Planning Council, Gregory Brenda, oh, Gregory, Greg, good to see you. How are you doing? All right. United Neighborhood uh, Services. Dove uh, Ostacher. from SBHDS and Kojo Flatbush. Good to see you also, Dove. Good to see you. Mm. All right, thank you very much to all of you, and uh, you may start uh, by stating your name, please, for the record. Got it, thank you. Hi, my name is Rebecca Gleskin. I am the Chief Statistician at Measure of America. I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify today and applaud the Council's efforts to address youth disconnection in our city. Excuse me, Miss, can you put the mic closer to you, sure. your mouth? Thank you. Thank you. In New York City, roughly 180,000 teenagers and young adults between the ages of 16 and 24 are neither working nor in school. This is far too many kids disconnected from institutions that give purpose to their to their days and meaning to their lives. What our research tells us is that there are astounding disparities within cities by race and place. These disparities hold critical clues to solutions. While the New York City rate is about 15.8%, in Manhattan's 7th Community District, the Upper West Side, um, the rate of youth disconnection is 3% which translates to about 391 kids. In South Bronx District 1 and 2, Hunts Point, Longwood, Mott Haven, Melrose, the rate is 33%, representing over 8,000 children. What becomes clear from these enormous disparities is that in order to better target efforts to address disconnection, we need more granular data than we have had in the past. In my written testimony, I have included more data, but with my limited time, I want to focus on what our research tells us about the most important factors associated with youth disconnection. There are five factors we found 
Uh, one, disconnected youth are nearly twice as likely to live in poverty. Two, they are three times as likely to have a disability. Th uh, three, while personal attributes like persistence, willingness to work hard, impulse control are critical for young adults to succeed, programs that focus only on these personal characteristics, characteristics are missing a vital point. Disconnected youth overwhelmingly come from disconnected families and disconnected f communities. These are places where parents and other adults also struggle with education or connection to the workforce. Fourth, a surprising and somewhat disheartening factor is that when we calculate disconnection across 2,000 U.S. cities 15 years ago, we found the rates of youth disconnection in 2000 were highly predictive of what they will be today. This relationship holds true even when you control for population, gro population growth and demographic change. And so what does this tell us? It suggests an absence of successful action for far too many years. But it also tells us that neighborhoods um, and many parts, like Brownsville, San Jerome, Harlem, East Flatbush, and South Bronx, where disconnection is the norm, sets a poor example for the younger children. Finally, five, as the data shows, place matters and race matters. But our analysis shows us that the combination of the two really packs a wallop. Residential segregation has dramatic but very different consequences for young youth depending on, our, on their race. In highly segregated metro areas like NYC, Chicago, and Washington, D.C., black youth tend to have higher than average rates of disconnection, whereas the white youth in these cities tend to have lower than average rates of disconnection. In other words, residential segregation by race disproportionately harms black teenagers and young adults. It also disproportionately, disproportionately disadvantages advantages white youth who are more likely to live in neighborhoods with good schools, strong adult networks, mentoring jobs, and convenient transportation. While the above factors show is that youth disconnection is not spontaneously occurring phenomenon. It's a problem a year's in the making. Engaged youth from middle class <coughs> neighborhoods rarely drift away from the worlds of youth of school and work. So in order to reduce disconnection, we need to support these kids in the context of their communities. There's an increase in research on what works and why. Summer youth and job programs do offer young adults va valuable things, self-confidence, money in their pockets, understanding and expectations about the workplace. But evaluations four or five years later consistently, consistently show these programs need to have a more lasting effect. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please. Well, good afternoon. My name is Rehan Mondal, and uh, I'm a program supervisor for the Education and Career Services at the Chinese American Planning Council, CPC. So Summer Youth Employment Program is actually a very big part of CPC for our programming. We've been working with it for some time, and we currently serve over 2,000 young people. So I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for you know giving us an opportunity for letting us to speak and to also collaborate with DYCD on this concept paper to work towards our young people. So. Um, Although everything was, uh, once looking at the concept paper, we noticed there were a few key issues that we noticed in there, and I just wanted to highlight a few of them, uh, not in any particular order. Uh, so the first one that I wanted to mention was the disclusion of uh, 22 to 24 year olds. Uh, we have noticed that SYEP for at least the past uh, five, six years or so, we have been having the model from 14 to 24. And we feel that it should be the same. With the new concept paper, it mentions that there's not going to be any more uh, SYEP placement in the community. Uh, from the community model is going to be cutting out the 22 to 24 year olds. And based off of our experiences, we do feel there is a need for these young people. I believe it was mentioned earlier today, there are a lot of young people, let's say, who are either disconnected or opportunity youth or individuals that are currently graduating from college, they don't have any work experience. And SYP traditionally has been the first job for a lot of New Yorkers, so I feel it would be a good idea to you know, allow that again, allow the 22 and 24 year olds to do SYP as well. The second uh, point I wanted to mention was the uh, 14 and 15 year old, uh, the proposed changes there. So I feel that the service learning project, it sounds like a great idea and we really do appreciate the project based learning. However, I feel that should be an option, not uh, something that's fully set. So I think there's a lot of young people that are 14, 15 that are developmentally ready to be able to take on uh, in traditional internship placement and I feel providers should have the 
opportunity to choose, either to do the service learning project or to have these young people go work at a work site. Because just like it was mentioned earlier today, a lot of these young people, um, not only are they going to be coming in, they might not want to do this because it sounds like they're back in school. A lot of young people, they're excited to be able to work in the summer, and now we're going to be telling them, hey, you're going to be sitting in a classroom doing a project, and that's really not for everyone. I think we're only considering a certain aspect of young people, but if you want to consider all the 14 and 15 year olds, we should definitely open it up and let them work because it has something that has worked. I'm pretty sure a lot of providers could say that has worked for them, and I believe it has worked for us as well. And uh, another uh, point that I want to mention is the uh, PPP, the price per participant. We noticed that in the concept paper it was not mentioned what it would be, but rather it was kind of vague. It was more of a range. It goes from uh, 325 to 1,000, and based off of what we are assuming right now, it would probably be 325. And if you consider all the different changes that are coming in, because as of now, even with uh, all the ideas that we may have, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some pretty big changes coming up front. So based off of that, I think the price per participant definitely needs to increase. I would say at least double. Um, I would say at least double for the amount. So 225 is definitely not going to work, especially if you want to have uh, qualified individuals who are going to be working with these young people. We want to make sure that they could actually work with them and provide the services that we're trying to give to them to give um, to make sure that the program is successful. And I think the uh, price per participant should also be specified early on rather than later so we could kind of know what to expect and make any comments on that. So overall, um, there's a lot more comments that we do have. Uh, they are included in the written testimony that we have submitted. Uh, at this point, I would just like to thank everyone again for giving us an opportunity to testify and uh, being able to work towards SYP and for our youth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Eugene, for the hearing and for all you've done to fight for SYP both um, here and on the steps of City Hall and on other places. Um, I'm Gregory Brender, and I'm here on behalf of both the United Neighborhood Houses and um, the Campaign for Summer Jobs, a coalition of more than 100 community organizations working for summer jobs for every youth in New York City. Um, there are um, a lot of in interesting parts to this concept paper, and we certainly agree with the commissioner when, we say, when he says stability of funding leads to uh, higher quality programs for youth. But nonetheless, there's, there's a lot of concern. And uh, I'm going to submit our response to the concept paper. You have that with you, which goes through sort of our concerns on each of the nine different modalities. But I just kind of wanted to go through three uh, general areas of concern. Um, one, as everyone has mentioned, is the price per participant. Um, this is particularly salient when you look at both the school-based model and the younger youth model, which require a much more intensive uh, amount of service. Um, so you, you, you know, when you look at the school-based model, it looks something similar in expectation to the WIOA um, in-school youth program. That has a um, price per participant of over $3,000. Um, when you look at the younger youth program, it's looking more like to some extent a camp program, a school-based program. So maintaining, uh, providing that kind of service requires a lot of resources, both financial resources as well as space um, in classrooms. Um, similarly, we would like to see the concept paper address some of the paperwork requirements that have become a big issue for providers. Um, standardizing in uh, many of the uh, things such as um, Attendance sheets, uh, time in uh, time and attendance, will do a lot to decrease the amount of uh, time that staff have to spend really just doing paperwork with this program. It's an intensive amount of work that ends up costing a lot. And as we try to transition to having staff spend more time doing youth development activities, we can't have them also uh, put onto these paperwork requirements. Um, and lastly, um, we want to um, maintain some of the traditional SYP for the uh, 14 and 15 year olds, for those young people who um, haven't been succeeded in a classroom environment and who are really looking for that um, initial job. Um, so our paper goes through the um, kind of all nine different uh, um, competitions there's gonna be. And thank you for all your uh, work on this. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Mr. Dove, please. We want to recognize the intense work that was done by DYCD to <coughs> help meet the expectations of the administration and the council and uh, 
We want to recognize that they did that under pressure from the council to do it and to see that all youth are, uh, are served. And we thank the, you, Dr. Eugene, together with the other council members for your part. I'm in agreement with almost everything that I've heard said today and with the, with the goals that are stated in the uh, concept paper. Uh, I was flying uh, a few months ago, and uh, there was a stewardess who was explaining where we were passing, and all of a sudden the captain got on and said, folks, fasten your sa safety belt. We have to land. So we've heard a lot of good ideas, but we have to land. And uh, we need more money if we're going to put some professional staff on, and we need some more money because it's been many years since there's uh, – it hasn't even been a COLA percentage in it. We, there are a lot of details of what we need, but we, if we're serving youth, we have to do it in a way that's going to work. And that's what I mean by saying we, we have to land. The concept paper talks about dividing younger youth into groups, a maximum of 25 youth. If that would work to an average of uh, 17 or 20 youth each, that would mean in New York City we're going to need without expanding the 70,000 youth and without expanding the 16,000 younger youth served last year, 700 locations, and not 700 educational professionals, but 700 Pied Pipers that will get that group through the career exploration concept successfully. New York City tried it in WLG last year, and it failed. This year, WLG is not doing this kind of career exploration with young youth. It didn't work. There was some exploration last summer with 1,500 youth. It worked for some, it didn't for others. There are youth who have to be taught how to button their vests with a one inch button and one button on the vest. Most youth don't need that. 14 and 15 year olds on a whole are ready for and will face their next year's education better with the job experience. And if, uh, if uh, we will leave it at that, with the, the previous administration in its wisdom or in its attempt to serve more youth for less money decided to break the program between 14 and 15 year olds and older youth. Uh, what this did is it gave every CBO the job of explaining to work sites who would like older youth anyway uh, that they need to apply for two groups. And they said, no, let's, we'll don't take on the older ones. And we said, we have the additional job in order to find work for uh, youth to convince sites to apply for two contracts, to convince them to set up two schedules, and to convince them to uh, deal with two sets of papers. It's wrong. It doesn't help. My idea is radical, and I would have been ra rather been first so other people could comment on it. I, I think that we belong going back and having one program. We're not saving money if we have to somehow find the 700 Pied Pipers in classrooms and fund them. Uh, we are better off with one consistent program across the board. We thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, we are running out of time. We should leave here by one. But I want to take the opportunity. Uh, I've been uh, listening to all of you. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Panama, for coming back. But thank you much. Uh, I've been listening to uh, you, service providers, and I may say that uh, day in and day out, you are serving those young people. You are in contact with them. You know first aid what they are facing, what you need to serve them. And I think that, you know, uh, I, I realize that you have not been provided with enough information and also probably the resources that you need to continue the, to do the wonderful job that you are doing. What I'm going to do, I'm going to contact the DYCD back and send them a letter to make sure that they take in consideration your concern and also your recommendation and I would like to see DYCD meet with, you, with the service providers to go over the new concept paper and to make sure that whatever the next step will be, 
and you will be in good position to continue to fulfill your job and to serve the young people in New York City. If you have any additional information or recommendation that you didn't have time to talk about, you can forward them to my office. And again, thank you very much for the all the wonderful job that you are doing on behalf of your, your our young people. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank and with you. The, thank you. And with this, the meeting is adjourned.